Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's so great to see so many people here uh, for this uh, great event. Uh, all of us like-minded uh, people who are concerned with uh, the plight of the people in North Korea. So beyond beha on behalf of the Global Peace Foundation, uh, Action for Korea United, uh, One Korea Foundation, and the Alliance for Korea United USA, uh, we would like to welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for these critical discussions today. And we welcome you to the Capitol and our Capitol Policy Forum. And as you know, we are going to be talking about support to a free and unified Korea, opportunities and challenges for developing a comprehensive U.S. strategy to support unification. And we are grateful to have all of you here and to be among like-minded people uh, who know that the future of uh, Korea, the Korean Peninsula, Northeast Asia, the U.S., and really the world uh, will be secured uh, when there is a united Republic of Korea. Today is the 80th anniversary of the invasion of France uh, on D-Day. Uh, it, it began the final phase to liberate the world from fascist dictatorships. Uh, a year later, Korea uh, was liberated. Uh, however, the seeds were then planted uh, at that time for both the division of Korea uh, and then, of course, the Korean War that continues to this day uh, with the fighting suspended only by an armistice agreement. And in that armistice agreement was recognition by the military leaders that military force could not solve the Korea question. The Korea question uh, is the unnatural division of the Korean Peninsula. And the military leaders called on political leaders to solve the Korea question. Yet 71 years later, we have not solved that question. So it is up to us, not only governments and political officials and military leaders, but us, all of us as members of civil society in Korea, in the United States and around the world to finally help solve the Korea question. Now today we have assembled many prominent thought leaders uh, to look at some of the key aspects necessary to achieve a free and unified Korea. Uh, we intend to use these ideas generated here to inform unification planning by civil society. So at this time, uh, we will have uh, opening remarks and then we'll have the first panel, we'll take a break and then have the second panel. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce to you the international president of the Global Peace Foundation, James Flynn. Sir, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and uh, welcome again to this uh, important uh, discussion on, on important issues on a very significant uh, and meaningful day. So we welcome you to this Capital Policy Forum, part of the ongoing series of the International Fora on One Korea. We appreciate you joining us here today, both uh, in, in person here and as well online. We look forward to robust and thought-provoking discussions as we examine aspects of U.S. support for a free and unified Korea. Special thanks to our distinguished panelists and discussants for contributing their insights and expertise. Allow me to, to make a few brief remarks about the Global Peace Foundation. GPF's mission is peace building, which includes efforts to resolve issues and rebuild trust after conflict, as well as to strengthen resilience within communities to prevent the onset of conflict. Peace building is the step-by-step -step process by which we pursue our ambitious goal, to build ethical communities and societies that are free, just, and at peace. GPF utilizes a values-based approach to peace building, grounded in universal principles and shared values affirming that our most essential identity is in our common humanity. Every person has the fundamental right to life, liberty, and pursuit of meaning and fulfillment in life, endowed to each of us by the Creator. And the incredible gift of human creativity empowers us to imagine, to aspire, and to dream. The power of ideas enables us to look beyond the way things are and to see totally different possibilities. To be transformative, such ideas must be given substance. They must be applied, demonstrated, and practiced. Hence, our work is essentially that. 
developing models that apply this values-based approach to solving problems in ways that advance peace, security, and human flourishing. Over the last decade and more, the Global Peace Foundation has given priority focus to a big idea, that the dire geopolitical and human rights problems on the Korean Peninsula can be resolved through unification. GPF and partners are building significant support and momentum toward the end goal of a free and unified Korea, utilizing a comprehensive approach that draws on the ancient ideals and historic aspirations of the Korean people. This Korean dream approach, championed by GPF Chairman Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon, has become a catalyst for a dynamic civil society movement that is Korean-led with international support. A key element of that international support is being developed through policy forums like this one. As we all know, decades of international pressure and diplomatic efforts have all failed to break the vicious cycle of negotiations, concessions, and provocations by the North Korean regime. It is long past time to consider new approaches to break this cycle. That is the focus of the International Forum and One Korea series. We believe that a policy framework focused on a free and unified Korea offers significant advantages. It posits a strategic end in mind to clarify objectives and to build win-win consensus among key stakeholders. It provides a policy framework for strategies that are comprehensive rather than narrowly focused. And most importantly, it affirms the longstanding aspiration of the Korean people for a unified homeland that upholds freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. That aspiration for a unified homeland reached a significant inflection point for the Korean people over 100 years ago through the Samuel Independence Movement. The March 1st Movement in 1919 united Korea, Korean people on the peninsula and in the diaspora in the cause of freedom and self-determination. Korean immigrants here in the United States became the main base of support for the independence movement for decades, linking the Korean cause to the same principles that motivated America's founding. That remarkable history is at the core of the deep bonds between the Korean and American peoples. Today, a new Korean citizens movement inspired by the Korean dream is rekindling the spirit and ideals of the Samo movement. Called Action for Korea United, it is building strong support among Koreans in the South and diaspora. AKU also includes many of the key leaders and organizations among North Korean escapees in the Republic of Korea, representing the hopes and experience of Korean people in the North in this comprehensive AKU coalition. In addition, Young leaders are emerging among North Korean escapees in support of this cause. There are young professionals, lawyers, media professionals, NGO, NGO leaders, and so forth, who have successful careers in Asia, Europe, and the United States. They share a determination to use their skills and standing to work toward a different future for their homeland in the North. We at GPF are proud that our colleague, Hyun Sung Lee, is an outstanding example among them. With the goal of building a global network of North Korean young professionals in support of a free and unified Korea, Hyunsung is leading a new annual program called the North Korean Young Leaders Academy, Assembly, sorry. Last year, the pilot program of the North Korean Young Leaders Assembly succeeded with well beyond our expectations. Its select group of participants had newly highly newly new and highly meaningful experiences, but also made major and immediate impact. They came here to Capitol Hill, to the State Department, and to important advocacy, advocacy groups like HRNK. They visited Philadelphia to learn about America's founding at, at uh, Constitution Hall, but also to uh, learn about uh, what was done in Philadelphia in support of the uh, Korean independence movement in 1919. Finally, they went to also to New York and shared their stories with UN officials, US and ROK ambassadors to the UN, and nearly 100 representatives from UN missions. 
their message had immediate impact, including in specific discussions at the UN Security Council. This year's uh, NKYLA is scheduled for late July. The intent of today's forum is to examine and discuss ideas on how the US and civil society can support the pursuit of a free and unified Korea, focused on two specific areas. First are economic issues. Considering the potential for positive economic benefits of unification that can mitigate concerns that unification would cause an overwhelming economic burden on South Korea's, Koreans. We are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt to present his cutting edge work in this area. The second topic is how to support the Koreans living in the North to seek fundamental change that can open the path to peaceful reunification. Our emphasis here is on human rights up front and information to empower the people themselves to seek the changes that must come from within. Our panel members today are leading thinkers in these areas. We have asked them to turn their remarks into papers so that we can publish a compendium of the important ideas emerging from this forum today. Finally, today's ideas and inputs will contribute to our next international forum taking place in Mongolia in July, just next month. That convening will further discussions through a policy forum in Ulaanbaatar, small working groups at a countryside retreat, and specific engagements with young leaders. The intent is to help like-minded civil societies in other nations to generate their own concepts for support of a free and unified Korea. I hope you find the discussions today to be both relevant and thought-provoking. I'm confident the forum will contribute in meaningful ways to advancing the cause of a free and unified Korea as the global network of support for this historic cause continues to grow. Again, we sincerely appreciate today's panelists for the inputs and perspectives, as well as all of you for participating in this most important forum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I think uh, after listening to Jim, I can tell you one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be a member of GPF is that this organization is truly focused on the pursuit of a free and unified Korea. Uh, many organizations, of course, uh, touch the area, uh, but uh, GPF is really committed to, uh, to this cause. And so that's why I'm, I'm proud to be associated with this. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to have a um, remarks presentation from Congressman Rob Whitman, who could not be here, uh, but we are grateful to him and his staff for arranging us to be able to use this venue. Uh, so he's going to give his, uh, uh, his remarks here by video, uh, and then we will begin uh, that. Hello, folks. I'm Congressman Rob Whitman. I have the honor of representing the 1st Congressional District in the state of Virginia here in the U.S. Congress. I want to thank uh, One Korea Foundation, the Alliance for Korea United USA, for putting together this symposium to really talk about the things that we can do to support and help the reunification of Korea. Uh, we know it's incredibly important. A free and unified Korea is important to the region. It's important to the United States, and it's important just for the for the causes of the people involved. Uh, the separation of families that we know there has been incredibly painful. We know too that we have to be able to deter uh, the repressive nature and aggressive behavior by Kim Jong-un. Uh, and my role in the House Armed Services Committee is focused on us doing that. And we wanna make sure we're continuing the policy of peace through strength that Ronald Reagan has put into place. We know that that policy works. And we want to make sure we know, too, that uh, that the examples are there for us. We know that the Soviet Union was defeated when we stood strong against the forces of evil. Uh, we look at how the demilitarized zone separates free people in South Korea and North Korea, really against the very basic human rights that everybody has uh, given to us by our creator. And there have been decades of failed efforts to denuclearize North Korea. Their continued aggressive behavior uh, destabilizes the world, creates problems in that region, and really endangers folks around the globe. Uh, their weapons testing has become much more aggressive. They're looking at doing more things to destabilize uh, their neighbors in the region, and they're doing that out of out of the ability to to intimidate others. We we cannot have that. Uh, he is 
Kim Jong-un is threatening the entire Korean peninsula, but also the entire region. Uh, we have to make sure we're standing up against that. Uh, we know the gross violations of human rights that go on there. We know, too, the countless other liberties and freedoms that are being trampled upon by Kim Jong-un. He is after one thing and one thing only, and that is the continuation of his regime. He has no interest in protecting and preserving the rights and the well-being of the people there in North Korea. So we have to facilitate a platform for North Korean uh, escapees to be able to tell their stories, to tell the, the repressive things that they experience there in North Korea, because it's only with those stories that we're able to highlight how important it is to reunify uh, the, 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 the two nations here. We want to make sure, too, that the U.S. government is part of helping tell those stories. I want to make sure that we are in enabling those individuals. And we've heard some, some incredibly compelling stories there, making sure we're raising awareness and pr promoting understanding of the challenges that that are faced by these North Korea escapees really, I think, encourages others to be able to, to, to tell their stories, but also others to, to take the risk that are involved in standing up against the, the government there in North Korea. So I look, to, I look forward to continuing to work together with, uh, with your organizations and making sure that we're standing strong for the reunification of Korea. Uh, we know that that's incredibly important for our future. So again, folks, I wish each of you God's continued blessings. May God bless Korea, and may God bless our United States of America. Well, thank you. Uh, that was great uh, to hear from the congressman. Um, so at this time, before we start, I'd just like to, to uh, give special thanks up front uh, to all the convening organizations, uh, to Congressman Whitman and his staff, uh, and also to all the Global Peace Foundation staff, the Office of Strategic Initiatives, uh, the communications team uh, who are making this happen. So at this time, I'd like to inv invite panel one to come up and take their seats. Uh, Ms. Hyun Kim will moderate. Uh, Hyun Kim is the president and CEO of the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy, an organization that I'm also proud to be affiliated with. Uh, and so please join us, panel one, and we will, we will continue. Slides. Ladies and gentlemen, Specter is haunting the Korean Peninsula, the specter of unification. At least that seems to be how many in South Korea nowadays regard the prospect of unification with their compatriots from the North. For a generation, ever since the Asian financial crisis of 1997, growing numbers in so of South Koreans are having doubts about any reunification at all. They worry about economic costs and burdens of bringing together as full citizens the by now impoverished tens of millions of northerners and their country of southerners who are by now not only comfortably off, but affluent. According to public opinion polls, the overwhelming majority of young South Koreans would like to cancel a free and peaceful reunification altogether, or in the words of the old song, just call the whole thing off. So here. To an outsider who's been visiting the Korean peninsula since the 1970s, seems ironic that the richest, best educated, and most technically dynamic generation in Korean history should lack so much confidence. As a foreign well-wisher of long standing, my message for Korean friends is simple. Unification is not thinking the unthinkable. To be sure, even free and peaceful reunification of the peninsula promises to be a daunting task, fraught with uncertainties, all but certain to require sacrifices for some possibly extended period of time. But the Korean people have done what many abroad thought impossible before. They can make the economics of future unification work too, if only they dare try. I'd like to make four points about the economics of Korean unification. One, the longer unification is postponed, the wider the gap between North and South, the bigger the task, and the longer it will take. Two, North Korea's present poverty is the entirely predictable consequence of three generations of extraordinary misrule by a worst-in-class dictatorship not defects of Koreans trapped under their control. Three, the economic reconstruction of Northern Korea will be an immense project, 
But if the returns on investment on this project are high, the project can basically pay for itself in the long run. And four, thanks to generation after generation of market-led development, both South Korea and the world as a whole are richer and more productive than ever before, better poised to mobilize and deploy the immense amounts of capital and know-how a successful Korean unification will surely require. So let's run through these points now, shall we? First, having studied the North Korean economy for many, many years, I can tell you that the so-called experts have only a vague idea about the true demographic, social, and economic conditions of life in North Korea today. The reason, quite simply, is that the DPRK has imposed a statistical blackout over the country for six decades. For so long, in fact, that it is no longer clear whether the masters of Pyongyang themselves actually understand in any accurate detail the workings of their own economy or the plight of their own subjects. Uh, what we do know, however, is that whatever numbers the Kim family regime happens to release to the outside world will be prima facie unreliable, doctored politically under the dictates of strategic deception to mislead an international community it regards as irredeemably hostile. Even the simplest of demographic numbers from the North fail the laugh out loud test. Uh, just after the famine, for example, Pyongyang was claiming uh, that its incidence of low birth weight babies uh, was lower than America's, lower than the incidence of low birth weight in the United States. So what do you think? Maybe North Korea should have been sending America food aid? North Korea's census counts, for their part, are riddled with so many inconsistencies that they appear to have been subject to wholesale falsification something that neither Mao nor even Stalin dared to attempt with their own population censuses. The upshot is that we outsiders cannot describe the basic conditions of the North Korean people. Health, education, employment, urbanization, productivity, and all the rest, with any degree of precision. We are captives instead of what economists call stylized facts. Nevertheless, it is apparent that the North is heartbreakingly poor and possibly even getting poorer. And it is equally apparent that the socioeconomic gap between the two Koreas is vast and the process of widening even further. Maybe the best available statistical indication of the changing fortunes of the two Koreas come from so-called mirror statistics reports by their trading partners of the commercial sales to and purchases from the DPRK and the ROK over time. No other data can offer a more exacting look at the performance of these two economies. And the picture that mirror statistics reflects is devastating. In the early 1960s, despite its smaller population, the North was actually exporting more merchandise than the South. North Korea was more industrialized than South Korea at the end of World War II, a legacy of colonial policy under Japanese imperialism. But as South Korea boomed, it eclipsed the North. Before the end of the Cold War, the South was reportedly exporting 30 times as much as the North, and things only got worse for Pyongyang from there. As South Korean exports soared, the North's share of global exports a measure of the capabilities and, comp and competitiveness, spun downwards towards a crash landing. You can see that there. As we can see from this slide, the export gap between North and South Korea has been growing greater and greater over time. The longer the two Koreas are separated, the greater the gap will grow. And the same holds true for all the rest of the social and economic comparisons we might want to make between North and South. The longer unification is postponed, the bigger the gap between the two is likely to be, and thus the greater the ultimate task of truly making the two Koreas one again. Okay, so now let's look at the second point. There's no doubt that North Korea ranks among the biggest economic losers in the post-war era. We see this here in its faltering long-term share of global merchandise exports and also by the company that it keeps in this uh, club of long-term economic losers. 
places like Argentina, which fought its way back from the first world into the third world, perennially in extremis Haiti, and selfless, hap, hap, uh, hapless, self-plundered Zimbabwe. In fact, North Korea has been running a historical race of sorts against Zimbabwe for the better, for the title of the world's worst economic underperformer, as measured by the share of world's exports. Ten years ago, the race still looked to be neck and neck. Both had lost over 80% of their global share market during the previous half century. But under the latest phase of the North Korean nuclear drama, North Korean commercial merchandise trade has basically fallen off the face of the earth. And the nation now subsists on unreported barter, economic piracy, aid cadging, and unmeasured but illicit Hobbesian entrepreneurship. How did North Korea, which at one time reportedly generated more electricity per capita than any other territory in mainland Asia, manage to become that awful dark spot on the map in those famous nighttime satellite images? How did it become the fourth world country with long range ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons? Ladies and gentlemen, this was not the fault of Kim Jong-un's subjects. We should never forget that the population of the North are Korean people, the very same Minjok who executed the so-called miracle on the Han. They share the Koreanness of their compatriots in the South, the signature traits of grit, hard work and drive, entrepreneurship and ingenuity. Ironically, these very traits and talents are perverted into ugly and perverse purposes by the rulers of Pyongyang. They're turned into cybercrime and drug running brinkmanship and shakedown diplomacy, surreptitious nuclear development on a shoestring budget of an impoverished state. But the very success after a fashion of these reprehensible initiatives should only underscore the obvious. Those traits and talents remain in the North all the same. And if only given a chance, the people of the North could flourish and prosper too. The Kim family regime, as Colonel David Maxwell terms it, is the architect of perhaps the most extraordinary economic failure in modern times. Not only has this dictatorship spectacularly squandered its initial lead in the economic race between the two Koreas, an edge bestowed upon it by the happenstance of colonial development policy in the Japanese imperial era, it managed to achieve the near impossible, to mastermind the only national famine, ever experienced in recorded history for a literate urban population in peacetime. As we see in this chart, North Korea has long held the worst in class business climate award, so to speak, in the rankings of the index of economic freedom. Of course, this is just one assessment, but it is hard to imagine what other current standing governments would be able to wrest this dubious distinction from Pyongyang and any similar evaluation. So, should we really be surprised that the government with the world's worst practices and policies has also had the world's worst economic record? Business climate matters, and it matters over the long run. I've showed this in some of my studies, and I'm not going to go into this work today, but these graphs may give a taste of that homework. That homework also gives a sense of how North Koreans might fare under, let's say, a better class of dictator. Even under Mugabe-style misrule, my research suggested, North Korean incomes would have soared. With China-scale corruption and repression, North Korean productivity might nearly triple. And under market-oriented constitutional rule, North Korean income would only be that much higher. Of course, human resources matter in economic potential, too. The Kim family regime has taken a cruel toll on the health, nutrition, education, and knowledge capital of the North Korean people. It will take time to heal those wounds. And as I have emphasized already, the gap between the North and South in this human resource ledger is only set to grow as the division of the peninsula continues. These findings might occasion some humility and compassion, and maybe even introspection on the part of South Korean compatriots. After all, but for the grace of God, but for a different demarcation 
of the 1953 ceasefire line or a different particular refugee count from the North during the Korean War or a different outcome to that same war as all too easily could have happened. But for the grace of God go the wealth and well-being of so many in the South today who might themselves instead have grown up under Pyongyang's immiserating tyranny. Had the dice of history rolled in just a little different way, many friends in the comfortable, affluent South today might themselves have turned out to be the inconvenient cousins under the rule of the North instead. My third point is very straightforward. Favorable rates of return make it easier to finance any investment, no matter how large. The trick is generating high rates of return and keeping them high. Obviously, this is easier said than done, but it's the heart of the matter. When considering the estimates, guesses really, about how many hundreds of billions of dollars or perhaps trillions of dollars in outlays and expenditures and economic reconstruction of the North could require, in a free and peaceful Korean unification, some readers will just find those orders of magnitude terrifying in the abstract. But to a professional economist, or a few of them in this room, uh, or for that matter, to a professional investor, the picture looks rather different. To them, the economic reconstruction of the North can be thought of as akin to an investment project. Economic reconstruction of the North, after all, is intended to raise up production and to generate income, to bring the North up closer to the level, economic level of the South. That being the case, the potentially enormous allocations for building up the economy of the North aren't just helicopter money. They are investments in a vast, complex, heterogeneous, long-term project, a project with both public and private components. Consequently, rates of return will make the difference between whether or not reunification is affordable. With high enough rates of return, even a mega project can basically pay for itself. The daunting scale and scope of project reunification, of course, will not be lost on listeners. But a few cautionaries against undue pessimism are also in order. First, although North Koreans at year zero of unification may be poorly fed, relatively unhealthy, and deficient in training, history has witnessed populations with analogous, analogous handicaps flourish economically in the past. The famine in Holland at the end of World War II did not prevent the Dutch from building a post-war post world-class economy. And at the start of their economic boom in the 1960s, South Koreans themselves were slight and small compared to today's population. Their life expectancy then was only around 56 years at birth, markedly lower than sub-Saharan Africa's today, nearly three decades below the level the ROK has gone on to achieve. Further, South Korea faced a forbidding Cold War environment full of risks that demanded a high and continuing military burden. And despite all that, South Korea went on to grow its per capita income sevenfold in the last quarter of the century of the Cold War. It turns out that a propitious economic climate can be a wonderful teacher. It can create great incentives and provisions for better health, too. Further, even successful unifications leave significant regional economic differences in their wake. This is true with Germany's, with Italy's, and with America's. U.S. reunification, you may recall, commenced after the end of the Civil War. A successful reunification should not be expected to bring absolute income equality to all regions within a country. Rather, it should be expected to raise incomes in the poorer regions and to do so much faster than in richer regions, in a process where all gain and regional gaps are mitigated. Finally, we need to recognize how the world economy and the South Korean economy have changed in our lifetimes and how these changes bear on financing a prospective Korean unification. When they discuss the outlook for unification, South Koreans often talk as if they're a poor country. That was true, once upon a time, not today. The fantastic success of modern South Korea has created a rich society on the banks of the Han. 
National wealth estimation, unlike GNP estimation, is an international research effort still in its infancy. But that said, private wealth holdings, excuse me, that said, pioneering work by UBS Bank suggests that South Korea's private wealth holdings in 2022 were nearly $10 trillion. That's trillion with a T. That would push South Korea, the South, into the top of the world's top 10 countries for total private wealth. And it would mean that wealth per adult is now high, higher in South Korea than in Japan. Wealth is higher in South Korea than in Japan. If unification suddenly occurred today, the newly reunified Korean peninsula would count as a fairly affluent country, even if no one in the North today came, came to this unification with a penny in their pockets. UBS estimates demonstrate this. Even with all those North Koreans, the starting point for overall wealth per adult in this newly unified entity would be about $150,000 per adult. About the same level as many Southern European countries today, far ahead of recent European successes like Poland and Estonia. And surprising as this may sound, a sudden Big Bang unification of the Korean peninsula would leave the peninsula a richer place today in terms of wealth per adult than Germany was, than unified Germany was a decade after its unification. These estimates are in, these estimates are in inflation adjusted dollars. So just think about that for a minute. Think about all the possibilities for a Korean reunification this implies. South Koreans have rather more economic and financial options in the face of reunification than they're accustomed to thinking. And the ROK could mobilize considerable further public resources for project unification if that project so warranted. The ROK has one of the lowest ratios of public debt to GDP of any country in the OECD, a tribute to the nation's admirable budget discipline in public finance. Borrowing for an emergency or for infrastructural development are widely accepted as prudent uses of taxpayer monies. Unification could, could qualify for big public borrowing on both counts. Without getting too detailed, basic ratios suggest that the ROK might well be able to manage an extra $1 trillion uh, equivalent, say, in public, pub, in public debt to finance project reunification. And don't forget all the private capital that's sloshing around in the world economy today for attractive situations to invest in. At the moment, private markets around the world fund over $35 trillion in direct foreign investment. That's trillion with a T. Private portfolio investment, liquid and easily negotiable cross-border commitments in debt, credit, and securities amount to another $70 trillion with a T. Ladies and gentlemen, there is plenty of money out there for attractive investments. Making the economic reconstruction of the North an attractive proposition for all involved, consequently, looks to be absolutely central to the success of the venture. Some of the steps that will be required for some of the steps that will be required to make project unification more attractive are fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, most of them are win-win for South Korea. South Korea must enrich itself and reform itself still further to prepare for the day when unification at last looks to be within grasp. There's considerable room for improvement in both regards. Remember that earlier chart on business climate? The gap between the score for the world's top performer, Singapore, and for South Korea is about as wide today as the gap between China and Zimbabwe. Corruption, weakness in the rule of law, irrational labor regulations, top-heavy corporate chapel structure that disadvantages small businesses who serve as the engine of job creation and growth everywhere, over-promised welfare state commitments that will come due on an aging, shrinking society. All these and more need to be addressed. For the sake of today's Koreans, yes, but not just them alone. If the South Korean business climate can be, uh, can be called on some day, to provide the North with a legal, commercial, and social framework, 
Koreans across the peninsula will need a system that can generate the highest possible rates of return for project reunification. We cannot know how or when the opportunity for a Korean unification will present itself, whether the free and peaceful scenario will come to pass or whether a decidedly less pleasant variance we can also imagine may be thrust on us instead. But I hope I have helped explain why Korean unification is unthinkable only if we fail to think about it. There are many in the South, most especially young South Koreans, who do not want to think about it at all today. They find the specter of Korean unification disturbing, even frightening. But then again, South Korean's youth seems to harbor a great many other fears about the future, too. Why is it that the rising generation in South Korea, the most secure, prosperous, and perhaps even pampered cohort in Korea's long and storied history, paradoxically seems also to be the most lonely, anxious, and fearful of the future? Could this be because so little has been asked of it? Could it be because these young men and women have, allowed, have been allowed to or even encouraged to dream small? How about dreaming big instead? Indeed, how about a dream for the ages? How about this? A deliverance of, of positively biblical proportions, a deliverance of tens of millions of brother and sister Koreans from a latter day pharaonic tyranny. How about taking part in and being remembered for a heroic saga that will be marveled at for generations to come? Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was a very, very hearted presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask, we have about 60 minutes left. I'd like to kindly ask of each of our panelists to have uh, about 10 minutes to speak. So the uh, floor is yours, Dr. Hughes. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we go. Uh, well, I thought that was a marvelous paper. And it is, of course, a big if. We don't know when the if might uh, come about, but we were certainly taken by surprise when Secretary Gorbachev did not send the Russian troops into Eastern Europe. We were stunned when the Soviet Union collapsed. I remember my family was on a vacation. We were on the, the Hopi Indian Reservation and they were driving out. Oh my gosh, Gorbachev, house arrest, what's going on there? Five days later, it was over. So I think the idea of looking ahead, being prepared, is, uh, is very wise and something we certainly should do. I think the, the prospects that uh, Dr. Eberstadt really laid out are very promising and I thought quite plausible. I would say even perhaps underestimating the, the role that the world at large could play. You mentioned in passing the international financial institutions and you have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, the Asian Infra uh, Invest Infrastructure Investment Bank, you have the BRICS Bank, you have the example of what Europe itself did when it looked at Eastern Europe and created a development bank. I think there would be that kind of creativity if the situation changed suddenly or even gradually over, uh, overnight. I thought again about the surprises that we faced before and how, how rapidly countries can change. I am, uh, I hate to admit it, old enough to remember Sputnik and how overnight this United States changed, which just showed the flexibility you can have. There was a congressman who worked endlessly trying to get graduate postgraduate support for the study of science and so forth. Couldn't do it. Sputnik went up, he changed the name of the, <laughs> the uh, Defense and in, uh, International Defense uh, Education Act, sailed through. DARPA was developed. The, our focus on commercial aircraft suddenly became NASA. There was a similar situation that happened that took people by surprise when a certain Fidel Castro came to power in Cuba. And my gosh, all of a sudden, Latin America was entranced. 
And if you read some of the papers coming from ambassadors, American ambassadors, saying, oh my gosh, there are peasant leagues in the northeast of Brazil. We think the country might go communist. Well, all of a sudden, we proved to be creative. You may remember the Alliance for Progress with the hands clasped across and so forth. And it, in fact, there was a, an emphasis on bringing together existing institutions, particularly universities, as partners with Latin American universities. So again, I think the potential, even not asking the Koreans to do it all themselves, but their real potential is there. There's another element that uh, we're beginning to focus on, that Europe, East Asia, the US too, are in a demographic, demographic decline. And Korea really currently is at the extreme end of that demographic decline. So it's true that, of course, the, the education, the skill level, as far as we know, would not be the same in, uh, in today's North Korea. But again, the opportunity, and you look uh, as a proxy at people from not only Latin America, but all over the world, suddenly think, well, oh, there's a chance to get into the United States. Few of them speak English. Uh, some are, are well-trained, some are not but all of them have an energy that wants to do something. And I, so again, I think that the absorption of North Korea might be even easier than uh, uh, Dr. Eberstart was, uh, was speculating on. And I think the, the idea of being well prepared, I think of a, a joke that was told about the, the Soviet Union, who had uh, Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev were all on a train train broke down. Stalin said, I know what to do. Let's execute the engineer. Khrushchev said, no, 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 no. Let's rehabilitate the engineer. And Brezhnev said, can't we just close the curtains and pretend we're moving? So, <laughs> so that should have been a warning to us. Something was not going well there. We didn't have the statistics right. It turns out after the collapse, we learned that the Soviet Union was spending maybe a third of its G, uh, GDP on, uh, on the military. That didn't leave much for a prosperous, uh, the expectations and as people become more aware of what was going on, I certainly don't know what the North Koreans know. I've just, one reads that uh, at times there are DVDs of South Korean soap operas that get to the north and so who knows what they really their expectations are but again i think dr eberhardt points not only to the the enormous development that's taken place in the republic of korea but that that has given them the ability and the flexibility potentially to be very imaginative in how they would approach the north so it's a big if you don't know when that if is going to happen. But I think uh, Dr. Eberstart has laid out a persuasive look at what South Korea almost by itself could do. And I think he hinted at, and I would add to that, this ability of all kinds of institutions that exist that could be easily replicated uh, in, uh, in a Korea, a unified Korea. Well, anyway, thank you for that paper. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Mr. Dixon, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here today. I want to also thank uh, Congressman Whitman for uh, uh, securing this room for us because, you know, right out the window there is the Capitol Dome. And that dome was just begun. It's a brilliant piece of architecture, but the, but the dome was just under being started and under, under construction when the Civil War broke out. And President Lincoln said, no, no, we're not going to stop building this we're going to uh, continue thank you joseph <laughs> and uh, i think that has to be our perspective with north korea uh, a lot of people think i mean the economy thing just that this session is happening is is revolutionary because before we couldn't even have a conversation about human rights because denuclearization uh, was we have to solve that first this uh global peace foundation's comprehensive view uh puts all the parts together and it's uh, it's just so thrilling to uh to hear dr eversat's uh, presentation and uh dr hughes all these doctors up here by the way i feel like <laughs> i'm not gonna 
get sick and I'm sitting next to a good friend who was uh, 20 years with the CIA, so we're in good shape here, uh, here today. <laughs> doctor. I know, but you're a CIA guy, that's the thing. Uh, so, uh, and on top of the Capitol Dome, by the way, is a, is a statue. It's called the Statue of Freedom. Uh, it's so um, always facing east. It was deliberately put facing east. Do you know why? So the sun would never set on freedom in the United States. And I think this is the last bastion for freedom uh, in the world. And uh, so there's a lot of great lessons here, but what a brilliant room. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. It's the first time I've been in here. Uh, the, um, Dave always asked me to, I, you know, we chat a lot and I have a background with the World Trade Centers Association, which mo most people don't understand at all. They think it's the Twin Towers is that and that was the headquarters of the association, but it's a network of, of business cent of centers around the world that support small, medium enterprises. And as uh, uh, Dr. Eberset mentioned, those are the engines of job creation uh, and job existence. I mean, they, SMEs in America are uh, about 50 per year, all the statistics are all over, I have to, <laughs> hang out with economists more often, but when I do research, the uh, the statistics are all over the place, And but at least around 50% of the jobs. So I uh, started one in Okinawa, a World Trade Center, and, and I had a, my mentor was a, a remarkable gentleman named Calvin Van Pelt. And uh, because today's D-Day, he was in the, in the D-Day landing, and um, he was a tank commander, 18-year-old kid, and, uh, 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 remarkable guy and he started the World Trade Center in Portland Oregon where I was living and so I brought him to Okinawa and we got one going in Okinawa then uh, that iconic structure in 9-11 I was in Okinawa when that was knocked down and 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 I was teaching a, a, a seminar to the Japanese self-defense for the GATI in Japan and and all these officers how are you gonna retaliate what's America gonna do what you know and I'm looking at these monitors and no, not knowing what happened to our, uh, the, the whole association executive team, two floors over there. And so I would, you know, <laughs> try to teach, go out and cry in the hallway, go back and try to teach. And finally, an inspiration came, we should make a World Trade Center in Afghanistan because isolation is what makes a country dangerous. It's what makes North Korea dangerous. It's what it, and it's what makes individuals dangerous. These shooters in America, they're, they're isolated people. So at least if we had a World Trade Center, there'd be some connection. There'd be instant network with 300 other centers around the world. Uh, so I thought, so I called my brother Aziz Sadat, who uh, had, was fighting for freedom in Afghanistan since uh, the Soviets took over. And he was an exchange student here. And Aziz is here today. Aziz Sadat could, Oh, could you stand up? Just really proud of this. This is a really frontline freedom fighter, and uh, he's still at it. Uh, here, uh, got uh, got out at the last minute with his w wife and family, boys, and no suitcases, and uh, uh, got back here to America. But now, uh, already working to to um, get back in the uh, in business over there, and. We worked hard to develop the, uh, the a foundation for SMEs because that's where not just job creation but stability comes from because the the um, uh, variety of uh, well the it's it's everything it's entrepreneurship it's uh, it's varied investments it it hedges against uh, uh, too much concentration in too few hands and. Uh, all of that so uh uh and there's also some friends from afghanistan here too and really proud to see you they're learning from this approach uh yeah thank you they came to learn from this uh, comprehensive approach and it's the same everywhere i mean th this is the way america was built it wasn't uh, uh it, it was it was built by you know in individuals and small groups small companies and uh just uh, taking on the challenges in the community. So um, uh, really happy to see the uh, Afghan brothers and sisters here uh, today. So uh, 
I thought then we should apply this to North Korea. We should make a World Trade Center in Pyongyang. So uh, <laughs> I did have a chance to go to, uh, I, I, I worked with, I was invited as uh, with the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. I know some people are not real happy about that. They say the hackers are all trained there, but, but the idea is, uh, uh, they, I've been told they learned all that in junior high school. They didn't need to go to college to learn how to do hacking. And w when you are in North Korea, it is unbelievable. They always show you these brilliant, genius, uh, p young people that, that just are, are remarkable. So uh, we did try to do that, but there are just too many sanctions and couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't get that quite across the finish line, though. But I... But I think the approach of small SME, working with the uh, small medium enterprises, working internationally, the opportunities are incredible in North Korea. It's it will uh, it's uh, it's uh, there's no holding it back. Only our thinking. So I really appreciate Dr. Everstadt mentioning the uh, think the unthinkable, dream the big dream, and not only that, we have to start planning the unthinkable. We have to start right from today. Uh, planning uh, economic development with uh, North and South. Start from today thinking unification already is here and how, how to make that, uh, how, to, how to make that work, uh, how to make uh, the opportunities. Because there, it's, uh, it's definitely something if investors here uh, should be part of. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eberstadt and uh, GPF for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon. And now, Professor Brown, for your thoughts, please. Hello, is that working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, uh, David. And, um, you know, I like to be a little bit provocative, you know, wake people up here. It's 2.20 in the afternoon. That's why you invited me. And uh, I'm not gonna disagree with almost anything that's been said. Um, but I want to sort of give a little bit of a North Korea slant on this. Rather, you, uh, um, my friend Nick focused on South Korea. Uh, I want to focus a little bit more on North Korea, which is really my uh, academic specialty over my, really my whole career. I look out at this room and I think I'm pretty safe in saying I'm the very first person in this room to ever uh, be in South Korea. Right? Anybody want to argue with that? I went. Uh, I went there at night. My parents took me there in 1953 to Gwangju, Korea. Can you imagine a more poor place in the world in 1953, at the very tail end of the Korean War? Now you're supposed to say, "You're not that old, are you?" <laughs> I was one years old. Okay, I learned to walk. Uh, I learned to walk in Japan, but I learned to drive in Korea. It's my, my biggest claim to fame, probably. So I grew up there, and I watched this country develop uh, through a lot of political strife, believe me, and a lot of economic, you know, people living under the bridges is what I may remember. People crashing our door, trying to break in, lots of, uh, lots of instability. Now, I go back a lot. I go back to Korea a lot. I'm on the board of Korea Economic Institute. And it, Gwangju is now a delightful place to live. But I want to talk about North Korea. Um, and uh, one word, though, about the unification. I think we have to be very careful. Unification um, or a combination of the two Koreas into one free nation is truly a daunting and dangerous proposition. I think more dangerous, the more richer you are. And so this is... You know, if I'm a Korean, South Korean kid, of course I would be incredibly afraid of unification. I don't, I don't, you know, are they my brothers up there? I don't know. Um, it would be hard to find a pair of countries anywhere in the world right now that are less linked than North and South Korea. Maybe the North and South Pole, maybe, maybe they're less, I don't know. Um, that, that DMZ, is kind of the, it puts to shame China's Great Wall. I mean, just nothing gets through except lots of animals um, or for any other wall you might think of. The interesting thing though, from an economist perspective is that that 
break, that division between the two Koreas uh, creates tremendous opportunities if the wall ever came down. When the wall ever, it's a man-made device, it'll come down, we can be sure of that. It's, we just don't know when. When it comes down, the, the reason for that is the, the difference in relative pr wages and prices in North and South are so different. That makes it ideal for traders to bridge the gap, what, what we call arbitrage. There'd be tremendous profits come from that. I won't go all into it. I do this in the paper here that hope, hopefully I'll will read. But um, if you look at that, you, you can understand the tremendous advantages to both countries. One thing that happens is the return on capital, return on labor, report, return on resources skyrockets when you have that kind of integration take place. This is what would happen, and I'm sure in sometime in the future, maybe tomorrow, maybe 100 years from now, this will, be hap this will happen, and all of Korea will, be will benefit. Problem is getting from now from getting there from now, and I've been studying this with Nick, you know, for what thirty years, forty years. CIA, I've been working on it for forty years. This is not a new issue. We would say the same. We would have the same discussion probably twenty, thirty years ago. But what's happened? Nothing, in terms of uh, bridging that gap. So I might sound a little like a curmudgeon, you know, what, what are we going to do now? You know, what, what, what's different? Well, I do have some thoughts about that. And I go through looking at, at the, again, focusing on North Korea. And I think there's a little bit of room for optimism based on what's going on in North Korea. I sort of uh, talk about three different, the, the way I look at it is this unity. I don't even call it unification. I like to call it integration. Integration is a much, much better economic word. Econ we're going to economically integrate these two very different countries. They're very different right now. That's the key point. But integration brings us tremendous benefits to everybody, if it's done right. So uh, to do that, looking at North Korea, North Korea has to prepare itself, and we probably have to help prepare it to um, get ready for integration, all right? I titled, I, I um, titled my paper Decentralization, Not Yet Denuclearization, should be our goal for, for North Korea. Decentralization. What am I talking about? I don't even like this, David loves this term, what do you say, the Kim family regime. To, to be honest, I don't really like that term, right? To me, it's not that regime, it's their socialist system, much more than their regime. If you think of the regime, you think maybe a family that you can knock out. And no, uh, I think that socialist system is really embedded in North Korea. And it's very, very hard, I would guess, to pluck out. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I, would hate to, I would hate to think that you can take out a, reg uh, a regime and not change the country. I think that socialism is very embedded in North Korea. This, after all, is three or four or five generations, right? It's not going to go away so easy. But what, what we can see going on in North Korea over, over in Kim Jong-un's period, the last 10 years, some very interesting things are happening. Uh, I put them in three different categories, uh, things that need to happen. One is this decentralization needs to put, take place. By decentralization means taking away socialism and replacing it with markets, market capitalism. So is that happening? Uh, you know, if you look at it closely, yes, it is happening. To a slowly, gradually, why? They can't afford their own socialism. It is so darn unproductive. So we have to watch, we have to help them decentralize. And just this year, they're pushing provinces, they're pushing stuff, the province. That's all good. They're doing some good things, right? Pushing decision making. Why? Because the central government can't afford anything. So they're blaming it, putting out, push, pushing it out. They call it self-reliance. That's great. What's wrong with self-reliance? Those villages need to be self-reliant. They'd be much better off if they were self-reliant, unhooked from the central government.
So that's one thing, decentralization. Second thing is creation of a, of a decent money and banking system. This is what uh, I'm sure growing up in South Korea, I focus incredibly on, uh, yeah, the, the Pak Chung Hee's change of the money and banking system in 1962. I remember when that happened. They went from a terrible Juan system, H-W-A-N, y'all don't remember that, to this new W-O-N currency. They made banking reforms. They got people saving. Before then, nobody would save because it would be evaporated with inflation. The, the interesting thing is this is happening in North Korea. They now, in the last 10 years, their won, North Korean won, has been stable. The exchange rate has been stable. One, North Korean won has done better than South Korean won in the last 10 years against the U.S. dollar. How did they do that? Well, I don't think they intentionally did it. It came upon them because they can't afford anything else. But they've dollarized. What dollarization means is that inside North Korea, people can freely use U.S. dollars and Chinese yuan. $100 bills, there are a billion of them in there. Not a billion bills, a billion dollar worth in there. The North Koreans now have hard currency money they could stick in their wallet. Wow, that is a huge human rights advantage, if you think about it. People with real money can buy the policeman. You know, they can. The problem for the regime is it corrupts the regime and they're struggling with it, but they haven't disallowed it. They sort of say, no, you can't use dollars, but then they're all using dollars. It's a phenomenal bow to capitalism over the last 10 years. It's wonderful, my thinking. And we've got to figure out ways to keep it going. The third thing that they need to do that is, um, I, well, I would say that is Kim's best um, uh, result in his 10 years, his, his uh, solidification of the monetary system. Not finished yet. The worst part, the third item, though, is what we need to be focused on for them. But it's what I would call an ownership society. Everybody on earth wants to own something. They want to own their land if they're a farmer. They want to work, own their tools. They want to own their human capital. North Korea, they don't. It's a slave system. And that's the hardest them, thing for them to get rid of. Um, I think um, it starts, to me, it starts with the, with the farms, the huge collective farms. They need to get rid of those collectives. Uh, China did that, and boom, you know, productivity doubled in 50 in five years in Shandong province when they got rid of collectives. In um, North Korea, Kim Jong-un seems to be dabbling with that. He keeps trying. Doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. There's something that prevents them from land reform. So that's where uh, um, it's a, I think I understand why so much of their control comes from owning property, owning the land, not letting people own the land. But they're clearly, it's so unproductive. They can't even feed the country the way, and they have a huge number. A third of the population is farmers and they can't feed the other two thirds. Uh, they know that, they're working on it, but they can't push it through. So again, this is something I think our side really needs to be pushing. I would say, in, uh, how do you do that? Through uh, Voice of America, for which does it. I speak on Voice of America probably every week um, and a Radio Free Asia, but we've got to be able to do much more, you might call propaganda. I don't know. It's, propaganda in America is a negative word. What's a positive word for problems? It's really information sharing. Yeah. So we need to, we really need to push better information in there. Just one little example of that um, that I talked to at Voice of America. So in 1946, I said, U.S., uh, maybe you don't know, after World War II, the U.S. Army, U.S. pushed land reform in South Korea. We pushed it in Japan. We pushed it in Taiwan. It worked spectacularly in all three countries. Uh, land reform, can you imagine U.S. Army doing land reform? <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, and uh, private owners, so you could, people in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea owned their own land. 
Now, unfortunately, a lot of people sold their land, you know, mistakenly and moved to Seoul. They lost their land. They did it kind of poorly. But um, the funny thing is, not funny, the interesting thing is Kim Il-sung wanted to do the same thing. So in 1946, his very first law when, when they took over North Korea, uh, Soviets behind him, right, right, right there behind him, um, said, okay, we're going to have land reform. You're going to have your own land. So he promised the people of North, the farmers of North Korea, 90% of farmers, you're going to own your own land. It was easy to do because the Japanese had left, Japanese owned a lot, and South Korean landlords fled south. They knew what happened in Russia, in Soviet Union. So they had all this vacant land, they gave it to the farmers. And he made a big proclamation about this, a land reform law and a bank to go along with it. It's very sort of liberalizing. North Koreans owning their own land, this in a Marxist system. Well, the problem is 10 years later, in 1956, they took it all back. <laughs> they collectivized it. So about uh, a couple of years ago, it was the 75th anniversary of that proclamation, right? So they like to do go back in their newspaper. They had an announcement. This is the 75th or 70th, I forgot. Maybe it's 60th. 60th anniversary of this big law. Uh, when we gave everybody, and the, the Norong Shinman remark is, we gave everyone what they always wanted. Full stop. They didn't take the next sentence. If you look at the next sentence in the original Norong Shinman article, it's, we gave the, the land in perpetuity to the farmers. <laughs> but they couldn't put that sentence in. Well, my point is, why couldn't we put that sentence in and broadcast that full blast to every North Korean? Should you read the whole context? Kim Il-sung, your great leader, gave you, the farmers, the land. And then put back in 1956, you took it away from them. We promise when there is unification, you will own your, your own land. You will own your own tools. You will own your human uh, capital. Okay, I think there's ways to do this, but the focus is really to focus to push it on the North Korean people, In, including the elites, including the rulers. All of them should want this. But I think our way of pushing unification is all wrong. The sanctions business. I won't go into that now. I'll run out of time. I can talk. We can talk about sanctions. Our sanctions. Of course, we don't want nuclear weapons. Of course, we could should sanction nuclear developments. But do we really need to stop Americans from going to Korea, to North Korea? It's crazy. Do we really need to sort of stop luxury goods going into North? What's wrong with that? Our sanctions are a cat catastrophe. And it's been that way. I've been preaching this way. My dad's a preacher. <laughs> preaching this way for 10, 15 years but it's just a total disaster. And we really need to revise these sanctions to focus on the nukes, maybe on ICBMs, maybe not on normal missiles. Focus your sanctions. Re uh, penalize ba bad behavior, reward good behavior. We don't do that. We just <laughs> splash them all. You can't export coal. Why? Why? Anyway, so that's... Um, that's my talk, but uh, uh, read my paper. It'll, I guess you'll, you'll publish it. If not, I'll put it on my website. <laughs> right. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah. As much visibility as we can get for all these. Okay. And one uh, comment, everything I write, I have to run through CIA publication review to make sure I don't have any secrets in it. <laughs> so it doesn't have any secrets in it. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Brown. That was actually very exciting. Not so much provocative, I'd say. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Hatchard, this is your, your time now. Okay. Is this on? Oh, I guess it is. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Now, I'll use my time here as the closing speaker on the panel. 
to bridge our discussion on economic considerations regarding unification into the next panel, uh, which will dive into the practical steps needed to support change leading to the, re to the reunification of Korea. So now, as, as Nick and the other speakers have masterfully explained, there is certainly a strong economic case for Korean reunification, inarguably. As a financial proposition, economic integration of the Korean Peninsula is entirely feasible given South Korea's immense wealth alone. What's easy to envision is, is from an economic standpoint, re re construction efforts would have significant returns if blended, leveraging the industrial giants in the South with the new access to space, land, labor, natural resources in the North. Um, integration at this scale would not only boost per capita incomes in the North, but it would also address demographic challenges in the South. Moreover, labor resources tied up in military conscription in both the North and the South could be redistributed and then made available in a market geared for accelerated growth. Now, with my background in the energy sector, I see reunification as an extraordinarily high return opportunity. The Korean Peninsula's strategic location in the heart of Northeast Asia would transform it into the regional logistics hub for the production and distribution of energy, incorporating pipeline, rail, sea, air, and other logistical linkages to produce and distribute renewables, downstream petroleum products, refined petroleum products, and um, nuclear energy, peaceful nuclear energy in an interconnected grid. So, um, and all of this, of course, would be supported by existing uh, South Korean uh, intellectual capital expertise. So this is just one example, and one, uh, the energy piece, is just one example of the potential success that could be made in a free and unified Korea. Um, and I mean, South Korea has repeatedly demonstrated its capability to mobilize and execute very complex public-private investment strategies successfully through large-scale endeavors industrial projects, land reclamation projects, the largest seawall in the world in Semangam, military base relocations, Kungongang Ijan. Um, however, reunification would require massive economic reform, of course, in the North, as Bill alluded to. Likely at a scale needing foreign investment, IMF involvement, highly innovative portfolio strategies, and of course, international cooperation. So it, this assumes, Caterus Paribus, that we're talking about a peaceful reunification scenario. Ideally, a peaceful reunification is the preferred path, uh, planned over several years with international support, well thought out financing, and well thought out integration measures. Uh, however, this is currently an impossibility under the North Korean, the, the recently announced anti-unification policy, which is being enshrined now in North Korea's constitution. Kim Jong-un's directive for a two-state policy abandons peaceful unification by revising North Korea's constitution to redraw the country's borders and position officially South Korea as an enemy state. And this title, enemy state, previously given by North Korea to only the United States and Japan, carries grave implications. Uh, we've seen the subhuman caricatures of the United States and Japan in North Korean propaganda. We've all seen the leaflets and, and some of the gross, uh, the you know, literally inhuman uh, caricatures of, of the US and the Japanese. Well we can now expect to see South Korea being treated in the same way. 
Uh, Kim Jong-un has explicitly stated that the rationale for abandoning peaceful reunification with the South is to allow the North to, quote, completely occupy, subjugate, and reclaim South Korea and annex it in case a war breaks out. Now, is this unprecedented declaration of the two-state policy by Pyongyang, is this reversible? Say, if the political pendulum swings back to the left in the next South Korean government? I don't think so. Uh, no, this, this is a, a very carefully thought out doctrinal change that has systematically culminated from what we've seen since probably the Hanoi summit in 2019 when Kim Jong-un failed to squeeze concessions from Donald Trump. Following Hanoi, North Korea enacted in 2020 the anti-reactionary thought law that punishes North Koreans up to and including death uh, for accessing and distributing South Korea and other foreign cultural content. This was followed by North Korea upgrading its nuclear doctrine to an offensive posture in 2022 including the use of tactical nuclear weapons to advance battlefield objectives in South Korea. Uh, and then finally, North Korea's decision in November 2023 to scrap the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement. Again, all of this culminating in Kim Jong-un's recent two-state anti-reunification policy announcement. So with growing confidence, North Korea now comfortably aligned with Russia and China in an increasingly multipolar world that is challenging the US-led order uh, in unprecedented ways, has made what appears to be an irreversible change to its reunification policy. So no, North Korea is not going to reverse its stance, even if the Yoon government is replaced by a left-leaning administration. Evidence of this includes North Korea's propaganda, eliminating the concept of Uri Minjok, which uh, is a move that essentially no longer regards South Koreans as being ethnically Korean. Um, the North Korean state has also eliminated all references to reunification, most notably by demolishing the arch of reunification in Pyongyang that leads to uh, the DMZ. So does North Korea's hostile stance decrease the likelihood of reunification? I don't think that it does. I think they may have changed their policies. It's just that rather than a peaceful, deliberate scenario, I think reunification under the current set of circumstances is more likely to be triggered by a spontaneous event resulting in the collapse of the North Korean government. Numerous implosion scenarios are, are plausible, um, imaginable, brought on by a variety of internal and external factors. These are the things that we have to plan for. And now, this is all in contrast, uh, and, and to its great credit, to the South Korean government, which has taken the opposite tack. Uh, and the timing couldn't be more incredible. So you have what's going on in North Korea, but while North Korea has chosen this hostile two-state policy and abandoned the whole notion of reunification, South Korea, under the Yoon Sung yeol administration, has doubled down and reaffirmed its commitment to the goal of unification grounded in liberal democracy. The UN administration has outlined three critical tasks. And this is, I think, going to bridge nicely into the next panel. One, raising awareness of North Korea. Two, inducing change in North Korea through some of the things I think Bill may have been alluding to. And then third, strengthening unification capabilities by fostering international cooperation and solidarity. And so this is what the US must support. Helping South Korea create favorable conditions for a free and united Korea. And so with that, I, I believe we're well positioned to transition in the next panel after questions.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really excellent closing remarks, uh, Dr. Hutchinson. So unification of Korean Peninsula, it's a real big if, and it's really unthinkable, but we need to think. And we are, it's a, it's the, I think it's a, the most a dilemma issue in, in the international community, at, as you all know, because we need to put, I think last time, President Trump, former President Trump mentioned the, the old options on the table. I think that that expression, I thought that's really on Korean Peninsula issue. And we have all the possible things that could happen. We could have war, we could raise war, we could have unification, we could have the collapse of North Korea. We have all the different really radical uh, options all together but right now we can i think next panel will talk about uh, the other uh, the more the defense and security issue but for now i actually want to enjoy our very nice thinking that we may be able to achieve unification focusing on this economic uh, benefit so if i may uh, ask one question any uh, dr everstad you could if it nice if you could answer and if there's other Panelists could answer. So, what is the benefit the international community will have economically from the unified Korean Peninsula? Specifically, what will why other other nations will be willing to help uh, for the unification? And also, then we do need a for that big if we need some preparation. Then what which nations which nation can be really involved to support for the burden sharing for the unification the cost and if and lastly if you have any recommendation advice from non -Amer non korean to the republic of korea internally what they need to prepare for the unification and also, actually, Professor Brown mentioned about your thinking what North Korea needs to be, how they need to be prepped. But if you have other other uh, advice that would be really nice. And so what other international uh, communities, some, you can just do not only the U.S. and bring other country could what they have to uh, help and prep to help the unification. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ms. Kim, and thank you all for the thoughtful, um, provocative comments, uh, creative comments, Bill. Um, I only touched upon the role of the international community because I did not wish to leave the impression that people in Korea uh, are the uh, lackeys or the help helpless supplicants of international powers in this situation. The agency for unification is in the Korean people, not in the international community. You have to put that front center at the start and the middle and at the end. That being said, there are many important ways in which uh, national governments uh, and international institutions could be valuable depending upon the contingencies and the circumstances that unfold. Of course, one would wish to involve international financial institutions in a very important way that would redu reduce the risks of lending and investing. Uh, of course, one would wish to involve friendly governments in supporting the security environment, which would also, I think, facilitate uh, the uh, mobilization of capital and the uh, inculcation of trade. Uh, we live in a uh, we live in a uh, world where we're we just seem to be at the end of a very important historical era. Uh, a holiday from history that we uh, rewarded ourselves with after the collapse of the Soviet Union and a period of great illusions. Um, 
need not get into that, but just say that history doesn't stop. And we might as well recognize that uh, the emerging geopolitical um, risks of uh, DPRK aligned with the Islamic Republic of Iran, with the PRC, with the Russian Federation, um, is more of a return to something we were familiar with earlier than something un unimaginably new. Um, a free and um, reunified Korea would offer enormous benefits to the world because the economy of the world is not a zero-sum game. More wealth in one place uh, interacting freely with other places creates more than the sum of the parts. Um, and so the economic dynamism and benefits of increased wealth in the Korean space would have positive impacts on the rest of the world, on the rest of the region. Uh, and a, uh, a security architecture that includes Korea in the free world would have great benefits, not just for economic prosperity, but for, uh, for global freedom and for global human rights including some dynamic benefits. I want to say just one small thing about this. I was so glad, George, that you went into the details about uh, the North's new policy. Um, I don't think that people have given the attention to this change in line in North Korea that it deserves and requires. Uh, the North Korean government has survived for this long, not because it's careless in its decision making. It looks at things very, very, very carefully. And reversing the line of the founder of the state is something that you would not do without the most serious and careful consideration. Um, there's much more to be said about that, but I just make one small point. Um, We see people in, we see the reports about people in North Korea being punished for uh, adopting and using South Korean accents. We see the reports about people in the North being uh, punished or imprisoned or worse for having South Korean videos, uh, for, uh, you know, for, uh, repeating lines out of Gangnam style, uh, you know, for, uh, for South Korean movies. Um, if I look at that and I ask the question, who's won the hearts and minds of the North Korean people? It doesn't look to me like Kim Jong-un. Thank you. Is there uh, a doctor? Well, I think you've added a number of elements that are very persuasive to an already persuasive paper. Uh, if you're thinking of what should South Koreans and I'm not a specialist on South Korea. I've been there, but uh, it's it's impossible not to be impressed with a country that, when development economists said 1965, what in the world is going to happen to South Korea? And here now we're saying, thank you, Samsung, that you're going to be building a factory outside Phoenix. Or, I mean, it's a remar remarkable change. I think the let's assume that it's it's peaceful or it may be just a sudden unexpected collapse but the preparation i would think would include a kind of opportunity of uh, a different kind of education that has been offered there uh, and some of it is busy I mean, after all arithmetic and algebra and calculus are universal languages that wouldn't be the problem but um I've been reading some of the work by Marcy Shore, who's a uh, associate professor at Yale, and she did a lot of looking at Eastern Europe. And what was the post-totalitarian mentality? And a lot of it, of course, suddenly, the Stasi was an extreme example in East Germany, where they released the files and said, oh, you're the one that told on me. You're the one that sent my neighbor off to the uh, concentration camps. And I think there's a little bit of that in uh, in China where people are saying, oh, yeah, I remember what you did to my father during the Cultural Revolution. 
And I think here, of course, there are memories of the heritage of slavery and how it worked out here. If you're from the West, I'm a country boy from Oregon, and we're more aware of the Indian Wars there. And again, the initial shock and uh, many of the Indian tribes were not well treated and it's changed. Everything's changed in the right direction. But that thinking of the psychological bends that you would go through. And I think South Korea should think about how to, to deal with that particular challenge. In addition, of course, the, the education and so forth. Um, I just think it's, you know, a peaceful, united, prosperous Korea would be a tremendous boon to the region, especially China, Japan, South Korea, you know, maybe a little bit Russia. I don't know. Um, I can't see, I really have a hard time seeing a downside to that. Competition, yes. Our companies are going to get better competition. They need better competition. Samsung may get some competition from North Korean industry. Yeah, they need it. Uh, I'm not so optimistic about South Korea without this something changing. South Korea is becoming very, um, I don't know. Yes, it's prosperous and rich, but uh, politically it's divided like we are. It's got these monster companies. Samsung is what percentage of South Korea's GDP? Do you know? It's, uh, I saw it a few years ago, it was like 40%. I mean, my gosh. It's becoming a centralized state itself. So uh, I think South Korea needs it, but I think the region uh, of a whole would be, you know, tremendously better off without this kind of hole, this black hole of North Korea. If you think you're in China, uh, North Korea is a big problem for any kind of uh, illegal activity. Macau is a problem. North Korea is a much bigger problem than Macau, right? Chinese money goes in there. You know, you're not supposed to have Chinese money outside of China. Well, in North Korea, it's all over the place. How do they control illegal stuff going on in North? They can. So I think it's a big, big issue for, for China. Anyway, I'll just say. I would just add on that some, uh, particularly the realists out there, would, would look at the current situation, the current geopolitical situation, and say, well, this is probably the worst time to be. You know, why are you guys even talking about reunification? I would argue that it's the opposite. I would, and, and for the economists and uh, investors, um, you know, in the, in the buy low, sell high scheme of things, this is exactly when uh, the narrative for reunification should be pushed. Uh, right now, the you know we're, the the narrative uh, is is very reactionary as far as what's happening uh, as as the geopolitical alignments are forming. Why not preempt that and pull the plug on that, and then double down as the UN administration is doing, and put human rights up front and tethered to human rights. The message of reunification and by pushing that you push a very positive narrative uh, you get away from the tit for tat that goes on in the geopolitical space which is tightening by the day and then you wind up being you know potentially uh using a metaphor or using a you know wishful metaphor you wind up being that person that people thought you know was crazy back in 1994 for buying a bunch of amazon yeah one one yes well oh, sorry Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I was just going to say one thing. I want to specifically thank Mr. Dixon okay. for saying he wanted to spend more time hanging out with economists. And I want to warn him, <laughs> we're a pretty dull lot. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yeah, just one, one comment that I forgot to make uh, that I think is really, really crucial. Uh, and it relates to what happened with South Korea's development and Japanese development and Taiwanese development. Mm -hmm. It's kind of unique in a way to East Asia. But it's very true for North Korea as well. And I think this is where we all tend to make a mistake. We sort of assume that North Korea is going to want the kind of structure, corporate structure that we have. So when uh, I, actually I quite liked Trump's initiative with Kim Jong-un, but I think they made a huge mistake by pushing this idea of foreign direct investment in North Korea. 
Samsung is going to come build you a great IC plan. If I were a North Korean intellectual elite, or certainly in the IC industry, I would be afraid to death of Samsung. I would be afraid to death of a lot of uh, Japanese companies, afraid of American companies. They want to have their own. This is why I like to push this idea of ownership society. They want to own their own companies. They should own their, they should develop their own companies. FDI uh, is sort of a shorthand way to get investment, but that's a Latin American way to get investment. It didn't, you know, Ford in there. No, Ford is not in South Korea. Hyundai is in South Korea for a reason, right? So I think we should sort of change the way we think a little bit. Don't say we're going to push our companies into your country and they're going to eat you up. That's the way the North Koreans will think. I would think the same way. You're going to develop your own companies. We're going to lend you, or you can borrow from us, fine, but we're not going to own you. That to me is the first huge mistake that the Trump initiative made. It's like we're going to, Western companies, South Koreans are going to own these. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Actually, oh, may I have one, one minute? Sure. Please, uh, Mr. <laughs> Dixon. Yeah. Is there any just, well, final? Just I would like to, yes. I, I think this is an excellent opportunity to, to redesign the economy and, and, uh, and avoid this table problem. I think that is, that is a, an, an obstacle. But I think uh, it's uh, that we need to think through every, like imagining that, okay, unification has happened. The, the, you know, the, the 38th parallel disappeared. So what, who owns what? How is property uh, ownership distributed? All the so finance, all these questions, but they can, they can actually build this uh, North, new North and South Korea can be a new nation, not just a, uh, you know, not owned by the, again, by the tables. It's a chance to reinvigorate the whole peninsula and the whole region, I believe, would, would follow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your profound and great uh, uh, presentation. And also, we actually could manage for nine, less than 90 minutes, almost a 350 degree thinking on this issue. So thank, please uh, get round the applause. Thank you. Very good. And let me echo uh, Ms. Kim's comments. I, I've been doing this for a lot of years, you know, and, and we started collapse planning back in the 90s, but I have never seen a panel that has been so positively focused on economic and, and financial and business interests. This is really a, a one of a kind, and I'm so glad we've got this recorded, and I look forward to, you know, publishing your papers, your remarks, uh, because the ideas that all of you have promulgated here are really valuable and, and useful. And so I thank you for uh, making this great contribution. Thank you. We'll take a 15 minute break and then have panel two. Thank you. And so I'd like to welcome everybody back. And it's really difficult to follow the first panel. Really difficult to follow the first panel. That was really uh, very, very insightful uh, and, uh, and, and really, some very substantive contributions as we think about uh, especially the economic aspects of of uh, of dealing with unification and what the potential are potential is all right so we're going to talk a little bit different uh, and George uh, Hutchinson's gave gave us a good transition uh, to uh, um, to uh, to move to this panel and I'd just like to make a couple remarks. In April 26 of 2023, President Yoon and President Biden really provided strategic clarity in 26 words. They said the two presidents are committed to build a better future for all Korean people and support a unified Korean peninsula that is free and at peace. And those are very, very important words. And, uh, and both President uh, Yoon and President Biden uh, uh, signed that statement. That said, since 2009, every president, President Iman Bak, President Park Geun-hye, President Barack Obama, President Donald Trump, President Moon Jae-in, have all signed statements supporting unification. Yet there has been very little talk about it, very little movement until, as George pointed out, 
the current UN administration is really, uh, really providing enormous focus on unification. Now in August, three leaders from Japan, South Korea, and the United States met uh, in the spirit of Camp David said, we express support for the goal of the ROC's audacious initiative and support a unified Korean peninsula that is free and at peace. And a second statement, the Camp David principles also said we support a unified Korean peninsula that is free and at peace. You know, as a former military commander, when the president speaks, I consider those orders, you know? So the question is, you know, how do we implement those orders? And, and so this is something that, uh, that we have taken on at, at GPF and that others uh, are, are starting to focus on. Uh, and we have the opportunity to talk about it uh, now. Now, uh, we're at a major inflection point, again, as George emphasized. Uh, those two statements by Kim Jong-un, uh, I think, um, you know, as, as has been said, they were well thought out. You know, the regime, you know, knows what it's doing. Uh, but I would say that uh, two things about those statements. One is, there's really no change. They want to dominate the peninsula. They want to they want to absorb and and dominate the entire peninsula under what I like to call the guerrilla dynasty and gulag state of North Korea. Um, the second thing is though that I think they miscalculated. Kim Jong Un miscalculated. And as I was taught by uh, Ri Jong Ho here, that uh, they il illustrate the failed promise of Kim Jong-un, that nuclear weapons were going to bring peace and prosperity to the Korean people in the North, and they have failed to do so. And Kim Jong-un cannot make that happen. You know, we know we can't eat nuclear weapons. We can't eat ICBMs. Uh, and so that failed promise uh, is, is really causing internal problems inside North Korea. Combined with no more peaceful unification, they've taken away hope from the Korean people in the North. That unification is, is what the Korean people thought would change their lives. And so while the, I think the thinking, as you say, was very deliberate and thought out, uh, it, it is dealing with the internal situation, I think it was miscalculation. And I think now we, and particularly South Korea, and as Nick Eberstadt emphasized, the Korea question has to be solved by Korean people. Uh, we have, a, I think, a responsibility to support them, uh, but it's got to be solved by the Korean people. And, and now South Korea has the moral high ground. It's pursuit of a free and unified Korea, uh, and they're the ones that give hope to all the Korean people. Now, there is a unique relationship uh, among denuclearization, human rights, and unification. Yeah, as I, I've said many times, and I'll continue to say, the only way we're going to achieve denuclearization and end the human rights abuses that are being committed against the Korean people in the North is through achieving unification. Uh, and, and perhaps counterintuitively, it is the focus on human rights that must lead to unification. And only when unification is achieved can there be denuclearization. And the connective tissue is, among the two is information. So we're going to talk about that. And I would say human rights is a moral imperative, but it's also a national security issue. It is Kim Jong-un has to deny the human rights of the Korean people in the North in order to survive. And as we saw last week when HRNK and, and Bob Collins um, uh, released a new report on slaves to the bomb, human rights are, have to be violated in order to develop their nuclear weapons. All those scientists and technicians don't live a great life, you know, as they are slaves to the bomb. And of course, Dr. June Pak, who's uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and now the Special Representative for North Korea, she always asks, who is Kim Jong-un more afraid of? The US military or the Korean people in the North? And of course, it is the Korean people in the North that he is most afraid of and he's most afraid of them when they're armed with information, information about the South. And in fact, the real threat to North Korea is South Korea, not its military, not the Rock US alliance, but the example of the South, the example of prosperity, uh, the example of the, the good lives that the Korean people in the South live. That example 
is what is a threat to, to Kim Jong-un. Now, as we talk about unification and we talk about human rights, I'm reminded of the UN Declaration of, hum of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Article 21 really says, and I'll say it succinctly, that self-determination of government is a human right. You know, the third paragraph says, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will be expressed or shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by the equivalent voting procedures, free voting procedures. That is saying in essence that all people, all of us, including the Korean people in the North have a right to self-determination. And to me, that human right really provides the basis for unification. And that's how we should look at this. It is, it is the human rights that really provide the path uh, to unification. Now, I wanna just say that too many of us Americans, uh, especially our government officials, we suffer from a unique disease and, uh, and they are infected by what I would call US unification dismissiveness. You know, despite all our presidents saying we want unification, the US government has taken no action to support South Korea in the pursuit of a free and unified Korea. And so it is really up to people like us uh, in civil society to really push our governments to support unification, but also to take it upon ourselves uh, to be able to, to do that. And as, again, as Dr. Eberstadt said, it is about Koreans solving the Korea question and, and freeing and unifying the entire peninsula. Now, I just have a slide up here. It is so complex. It is a wicked problem to think about unification in Korea. It's the most complex, difficult, and most people get bogged down in what are the paths to unification. Well, there are four paths. Obviously, war is, is one, you know, the most dangerous, and we don't want that to happen. Regime collapse is another one, but that's also dangerous and complex. complex. Of course, we want the peaceful one, you know, we want the five R's, respect, reconcile, reform, rebuild, and reunify. And South Korea must plan for peaceful unification, even though, as we know, Kim Jong-un will never submit to that. But all of that detailed planning for peaceful unification will apply in every other scenario, every other path to unification. And the outlier, of course, is internal change inside North Korea, regime transition new emerging leadership. And if we use information correctly and influence new emerging leaders, those are the ones that can seek peaceful unification. Now, okay, I just wanna leave this slide up here uh, to think about this. And really, you know, as Clausewitz said in war, everything is simple, but even the simplest thing is hard. There are really three things we have to think about. Human rights up front, information, and the pursuit of a free and unified Korea. Whatever happens on the Korean Peninsula is gonna have global effects, whether it's war or regime collapse. But a unified Korea, as we heard today, is gonna to have global benefits. We're all gonna benefit. And so we wanna move from this darkened North, you know, to where we can cross out North and South and have a unified, a united Republic of Korea, U-R-O-K, -okay, which we could call that name U Rock. So we've assembled the, uh, a great group of people here, thinkers, experts, uh, to offer their views on how to seek change uh, through various means. And Ambassador Joseph here has led a team, uh, a working group uh, that has really done some great work on, uh, on thinking about human rights uh, and, and unification. And so we're gonna go down the line here uh, and, uh, and speak about 10 minutes and then have a Q&A. Okay. Ambassador Joseph, over to you. Dave, thank you very much. It's greatly appreciate being here with such distinguished colleagues. I'd also like to thank the Global Peace Foundation for all of the great work that they do in so many, in so many areas. And I'd like to thank Nick, Nick Eberstadt, uh, for his brilliant analysis. Uh, I think his analysis provides the 
let me say it removes a barrier. It removes a barrier to sound policy. The economic aspect of unification uh, has often been seen as an impediment uh, as, a, as opposed to a benefit. And I think Nick, in his brilliant analysis, makes, makes the argument very convincingly that a unified North Korea is an economic plus for the region and for the world. And so I think Nick deserves a great deal of, of credit. As Dave said, our task, and I'm reading from the, uh, the notice for this, uh, this meeting, our task is to broadly answer the question of how to support creating conditions for change that will lead to a free and unified Korea. So let me start by identifying three, what I call foundational facts foundational facts that also serve as pillars for the survival of the Kim regime. The first is human rights denial. The regime is clearly dependent on the continued totalitarian control of the captive population, denying all civil and human rights to its own citizens through repression, through brutality, which is only getting worse, getting more pervasive through technology and greater surveillance capabilities, through control over information, all aspects of information, which, which Dave uh, referred to, through the curtailment of movement uh, from the COVID period that has continued to, to today. But most of all, and I agree with Dave, it is, it is the control of information. And that is a key to the end of the regime. And I'll come to that. Second is the nuclear program. And I came at this issue from a nonproliferation background. And I came to the conclusion a long time ago that US policy, which I represented uh, at least for a number of years, uh, had it backwards. The idea was that we would resolve the nuclear issue and then we would move to other issues, whether they be human rights or any of the other issues that are associated with the spectrum of threats represented by North Korea. But nuclear was always given primacy. I think that's fundamentally wrong. And I think that my sense can be confirmed by the fact that we have failed in terms of containing the nuclear program in North Korea for over 30 years. Okay, how hard does it come, how hard is it to come to the conclusion that the policy that we pursued is a failure when, when North Korea has moved from a small reprocessing capability to large scale enrichment capability? from two to three nuclear weapons to 40 to 60 nuclear weapons to a projected potential over 200 nuclear weapons by 2025. 2025 is a blink of an eye. And that is a threat that we're not prepared for. What does North Korea do with 200 weapons? Sure, they have plenty for strategic purposes, threatening American citizens through, their, through delivery by ICBM class missiles. Okay, so maybe 20, 30. Yes, they can use nuclear weapons, and they've talked about it on the battlefield, so-called tactical nuclear weapons. But that leaves them a whole lot more. And what are they going to do with that whole lot more? Well, if the past is prologue, they're likely to sell them. And just keep that in mind, because I know a lot of people will say, well, if they ever sold a nuclear weapon to another rogue state or to a terrorist organization, we would turn them into glass. I've heard that over and over and over again. Not once have I ever believed it. Not once. This is a threat that we're not prepared for. And it's coming at us, and it's coming at us quickly. We know about it. And yet, there was a phrase in, 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 from one of the panelists uh, in, in, uh, in, in the last session, Let's just close the curtain and pretend it's not happening. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. The third foundational factor, in my view, is unification. 
And like the human rights situation, like the, like the uh, nuclear situation, it's getting worse. And we've seen that in the, ch the, the change of official policy of North Korea, which I believe was well thought out. They do things that are well thought out, but it's not irreversible in my view. I mean, I always go back to George Orwell. They, they can change yesterday's weather, okay, uh, on a dime. But you have to think, I think, about these three factors uh, together. And none of them will be resolved, in my view, independently. They can only be resolved together. And that is because of the interconnections of the three. Bob Collins uh, has recently produced and published by HRNK the book Slaves to the Bomb, which demonstrates, I think, very clearly the human rights denial of even the nuclear scientists and engineers and their families, over 6,000 people who are, who are surveilled, who are threatened, who are denied their fundamental rights when they're exposed to radiation, for example. It's a work that demonstrates very clearly the interrelationship between human rights and the nuclear program. And I think that's, that, that's in, important to keep in mind. And in turn, the nuclear program and the nuclear capability is also designed for, as I said, regime survival, because the nuclear program will, according to the North Koreans, will allow them uh, to continue to exploit their own people. They don't put it quite that way, but will allow them to, to, to continue the regime without concern about outside intervention. They will deter the United States. They will deter outside intervention. That could occur for humanitarian purposes or for any other purpose. And remember Libya. And the Libya model is one that I think resides very, uh, very clearly in the minds of North Korean leadership. Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons in 2003. Eight years later in 2011, and I would say under a different administration, the United States, Europe, and other countries intervened against Gaddafi. Gaddafi ends up literally dead in a ditch. And the message there is, if he had kept his nuclear weapons, or at least this is, this is the, 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 the rationale that's often given, if he had kept his nuclear weapons, uh, he would still be uh, ruling in, uh, in Libya. And I think what this tells us, at least me very strongly, is that as long as the Kim regime exists, you will not get a resolution of the human rights problem. You will not get a resolution of the nuclear uh, threat, and you will not get a resolution or you will not make progress on unification. So I think the three are, 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 are clearly, are clearly tied together. And our policy has treated each of these in a separate, as a separate silo, okay? We'll do nuclear. And once we do nuclear, we'll do, we'll do human rights. And with regard to unification, my sense is it's been basically a talking point without much substance behind it. I, that's not, you know, that's, that's a formula for failure. And we failed over and over and over to make progress. So what do we need to do? We need to have a fundamentally different shift, a fundamental shift in our, in our thinking, a paradigm shift in how we deal with North Korea. We need to consider our goals, whether it's nuclear, human rights, unification, together and understand that as long as the Kim regime exists, we will not achieve success. So we need to focus, we need to have a laser focus on achieving a different regime. Call it regime change from within, call it, call it unification, call it whatever you want to, but we need to end the, the Kim dynasty, the Kim regime. And how do we do that? Well, we change our policy, okay? We focus on a more comprehensive, we, we develop a more comprehensive approach. 
we determine that we're not going to provide concession after concession, which only feeds the beast, and we've seen that for 20 years. And we bring together in, a, in, a, in an integrated way, economic tools, military tools, diplomatic tools, and most important, promoting human rights through information. And this was the conclusion of the group that David was part of, Greg was part of, Nick Eberstadt was part of, Bob Collins was part of, uh, uh, Joe Detrani uh, was, uh, was, was part of, uh, and uh, Olivia Enos was part of, and you can, you can find that publication uh, on, online. Uh, just, uh, just to uh, uh, wrap up, uh, I would say that it's true that we've had this discussion for 30 years. It's about time for change. Otherwise, in five years from now, we'll be dealing with a North Korea that's much different from the one that we're dealing with today. It'll be much more dangerous. How, how, do, you, how do you achieve change in the US system? Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to uh, overcome the antibodies to change, whether it's in the Pentagon or whether it's in the State Department. And what you need is a president who is laser focused, who comes into office with, with the objective of fundamentally changing US policy. Because if we don't do that, if we don't change how we think about North Korea, it's a very bleak future. I know I'm not known for my optimism, and it might be apparent to everybody, but I think, I think this is a realistic assessment, and I will leave it at that. So let me just, that was, as always, a great and brilliant, but one thing that you left out, and, and you finished with this, the key is leadership. Tell us about a leader who you worked for who was able to walk and chew gum and to take on more, more than one issue at a time and exercise the leadership, kind of leadership that we need. I will give you two examples. One, when I was very young, and it was the Reagan administration. And I had gone in as an intern, right? I mean, uh, it, was, it was a long time ago, uh, but I had, uh, uh, I had worked uh, a number of nuclear-related issues. I'd written a paper on, uh, on actually, actual the actually theater nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, which had been read by Caspar Weinberger, et cetera. And so I, so, uh, I, I was recruited uh, to join government. And I was teaching at the Fletcher School uh, at the time. And I said to myself, I'll go into government for two years. I'll come out a much better teacher. I'll go back to Fletcher and teach. Well, 26 years later, I left government. But the point is, in the Reagan administration, Ronald Reagan was determined that human rights be part of the agenda, the strategic agenda, the four-part agenda with, with the Soviet Union. And even though my focus was more on the nuclear arms control side, the president exercised leadership. And every time that the Secretary of State and those other sort of leaders, you know, cabinet level uh, leaders would say, well, you know, if only we put the human rights aside for the moment, we'll come back to that. We agree with you, Mr. President, 100%, but now is not the time for human rights. And Reagan said, no. Reagan said, human rights will be part of this agenda. And he, st and he stood by that. And did that sabotage the arms control negotiations? No. Did, did the Soviets like it? No. They screamed like banshees. They didn't want that. And so would North Korea. They don't want, they don't want us raising the issue of human rights. But Reagan exercised the leadership and achieved the objectives, the broad objectives, in a broad, comprehensive strategy. The other example I give you uh, is, is Bush 43. Bush 43 came into office convinced that we needed to get out of the ABM Treaty. Many of you won't, think, won't remember the ABM Treaty. The ABM Treaty was a treaty that was uh, Signed in 71, I think it went uh, into effect in 72. And for over 30 years, it dominated American strategic thinking. If we build defenses to protect our country from a missile attack, that will only 
spur an arm, that will, that will create an arms control, uh, an, an arms race rather. That will be the end of arms control. It will, it will, it would lead to an arms race. Bush said no. Bush said, hey, the Soviet Union's gone. What a radical thought. Maybe we can have a different relationship with Russia. But more importantly, we have new threats. We have a North Korea threat. And remember, it was just months before Bush took office that North Korea tested the Taipo Dung, right? The Taipo Dung 2, which, which according to the agency, the, the CIA had the ability to deliver a small payload to the United States. And we were told on classified uh, 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 intelligence assessment that they had one, they had the, enough plutonium for one to two nuclear weapons. And Bush said, we need to prepare for this threat because they're going to have more nuclear weapons. They're going to have more capable uh, 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 missiles. And so he directed that we get out of the ABM treaty. I mean, personally, I had been fighting the ABM treaty for 20 years in various capacities in government. And I had the uh, privilege of joining the administration on the first day. And I was assigned the task of sort of shepherding, getting out of the ABM treaty. The first thing I did on the first day was tell the State Department that they were not to say one word about the ABM treaty. Not one word. Because everything they said was, the, you know, the ABM treaty is important for stability. It's the cornerstone of strategic relations with, uh, you know, with the Soviet Union, now with Russia. We needed a fundamental shift in how we thought about it. And it was only because the president came in determined to do this. And sometimes if you've got a president who's determined to do it, not everyone salutes. Dave, I'm sorry, sorry to disillusion you. Not everyone does that. In fact, you have to fight and fight even if the president is on your side. But the president was determined and he held us accountable for getting out of the treaty. And what happened when we got out of the treaty? Did we have, did we have an arms race? I'm, su I, I'm surprised that the Russians haven't taken the, uh, Putin's statement off the uh, Kremlin website the day that we got out of the ABM treaty. He said that this is not a threat to Russia and Russia will continue to reduce its strategic offensive forces by the thousands. So this myth about, you know, if, if we get out, there'll be an arms race. It was just that. And we had to think differently about this. And we could only achieve that goal if we had a president who was determined, who appointed the people, who we held accountable to make it happen. Yeah, I just really want to emphasize that point. And from our perspective as citizens, you know, we've got to put pressure on our leaders to execute and exercise that type of leadership. And uh, because without it, frankly, we're not going to get, get very far. Thank you. Uh, Greg, the Executive Director for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Over to you. Thank you very much, Colonel Maxwell. Uh, let me begin by thanking President James Flynn, our GPF to, uh, friends, for this invitation uh, as a testament uh, to the, the ever-grown relationship between uh, GPF and HRNK. Several HRNK board members are here today. Uh, Ambassador Robert Joseph, Colonel David Maxwell, Dr. Nicholas Seberstad, Dr. Yi Song Yun. Uh, we almost have quorum. We could almost have an HRNK board meeting. Uh, my uh, distinguished co-panelists have made my life easy by providing an introduction to my presentation. A few days ago, a friend encouraged me to reflect on the legacy and vision of the founders of HRNK. One of them was Dr. Fred Charles Eclay, a Swiss-born brilliant American, Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy during the Reagan administration. Uh, our Afghan friends will have very fond memories um, about his legacy, of course. Um, he was one of the founders of HRNK. He passed away in 2011, unfortunately, uh, reflected in his iconic book, Annihilation from Within, The Ultimate Threat to Nations. Dr. Reclay made a chillingly accurate prediction. In his own words, democratic governments can't stop nuclear proliferation and can not prevent medical advances in biotechnology from being misused by some country to make biological warfare agents. Short of a cataclysmic upheaval, 
There is no historic force, no political movement, no unifying religion in sight that could halt such developments. And yet, in the case of North Korea, Dr. E. Clay found that the best and perhaps only pressure point would be the regime's human rights record. Human rights violations that the UN Commission of Inquiry would later find to shock the conscience of mankind were the only avenue to delegitimizing a regime whose nuclear weapons development human rights denial nexus would make it a menace to regional and international peace. As a founder of our organization, Dr. Rick Clay forged a vision aiming to do away with the North Korean nuclear threat by delegitimizing the Kim regime domestically and internationally and fostering change transformation from within by and through the people of North Korea. Information campaigns are an integral part of this vision. In the aftermath of six North Korean nuclear tests and with 200,000 still imprisoned in North Korea's gulag, has Dr. E. Clay's vision for North Korean human rights yielded results or has his grim prediction been confirmed in the case of North Korea as well? And of course, we have seen developments at the UN here, the North Korean Human Rights Act, the establishment of the position of the Special Envoy, uh, and other developments that have constituted solid steps in terms of raising awareness of North Korean human rights. Information campaigns are extraordinarily important. True transformation can only come from the people of North Korea. I used to talk about three fundamental stories that must be told to North Koreans. The first one is the story of their own human rights. They don't know, they don't understand. They, well, the DPRK has acceded to the International Covenant on uh, civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights based on their own constitution, based on the Women's Convention, the Children's Convention, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which they have acceded to. These fundamental human rights should be observed. None of them are. Each and every conceivable human right is violated in North Korea. The people of North Korea must be told, must understand this first point. The second point is the corruption of the Kim family regime. There is no, practically no private property in North Korea. There is entrepreneurship. One has to rely on the protection of powerful regime agencies and individuals in order to engage in entrepreneurial activity. This is a recipe for great corruption. And of course, the greatest corruption is at the very top, at the very core of the Kim family regime. Thirdly, the story of the outside world, in particular, the story of free, democratic, prosperous Republic of Korea. Um, my good friend and board member and mentor, Colonel David Maxwell, mentioned the UN Charter and the right to self-determination. Of course, the right of self-determination was emphasized through the 14 points of President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, it was put into practice post-World War I through the Treaty of Versailles with uh, new nations emerging from the ruins of empires. And of course, in the case of Korea, Kim Il-sung has been talking about nationalism, but Kim Il-sung refers to nationalism as eguk chui, patriotism, which to us would be positive nationalism. To uh, Kim Il-sung, min jok chui is what to us is negative nationalism, toxic nationalism of the kind that results in great disasters and genocide. What's happening right now? As my good friends, uh, Mr. Ri Jong-ho and uh, Mr. Hyun Sung Lee would confirm, uh, we are, uh, Witnessing a, okay, let me try the term, de Kimisongization, apparent de Kimisongization of North Korea as Kim Jong un is attempting to establish his own personality cult. April the 15th was not referred to the day of the sun, Taeyang Jol, only in one article, in Nodong Shimon, Bill Brown reads it. Um, uh, the, the, the Kim Il Sung school, right, Hyun Sung for party cadres, is no longer the Kim Il Sung school. Now, North Korean people have been exposed, bombarded with ideology day in and day out. I think this creates a, a terrific opportunity to replace that ideological vacuum with other ideas through those three stories and through talking to North Koreans about the idea of Korean nationalism. 
Why is it the same nation? Well, 1,000 years of shared culture, history, language, that certainly does make a nation. Of course, the notion of mean joke mentioned by uh, Nick Eberstadt earlier is reliant exclusively on ethnic nationalism, with na nationality equaling ethnicity, ethnicity equaling blood, membership in a nation being ethnicity by nature. Of course, there is another branch of nationalism, civic nationalism, where nationality is determined by law, naturalization is possible, and um, of course, the individual is the basis of the collective. Based on prior experience, um, ethnic nationalism is conducive to unification. In the case of the two Koreas, ethnic nationalism will be conducive to unification. However, civic nationalism will be conducive to successful unification and the eventual modernization of the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. So a healthy balance between ethnic and civic nationalism will be needed in order to prepare for that the people of North Korea must be told the story of Korean nationalism. The Korean nation did not begin with Kim Il-sung, and Korean nationalism is not only exclusively ethnic. It has to do with the principles that govern a free, prosperous, democratic Republic of Korea, South Korea. Will this be mere absorption into South Korea? Well, based on precedent, most likely not. In 1859, the principalities of Wallachia and Moldova were united. They became Romania, of course. I'm, I'm entitled to using that as a precedent. Um, so, and what followed? This was based on ethnic nationalism brought about uh, by enlightened young men and women. Um, and of course, a healthy dose of civic nationalism resulted in the modernization of Romania which led eventually to unification of Transylvania after the uh, Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Failure to balance civic and um, ethnic nationalism resulted in disaster eventually in the 1930s and in the 1940s until um, well right before the communist uh, takeover. So the same was applicable to Germany after the, the Zollverein, the Customs Union of uh, 1834 and the eventual unification in 1871. Of course, Prussia was the most influential uh, German entity that became part of a unified Germany. Uh, but this was not Greater Prussia. This was uh, a different political entity with a different identity. And that is most likely going to happen in the case of uh, Korean unification as well. The bottom line, what I always tell younger friends in South Korea in particular, is that, of course, these 76 years of separation have created great differences, ideological, economic, uh, the stature and body weight and appearance of South and North Koreans was mentioned earlier by, by Dr. Eberstadt and the other speakers. But on the other hand, the two Koreas shared 1,000 years, one millennium of common history, language, culture, civilization, um, in my view, and I believe in the view of everyone in this room and beyond, Korean unification is not a matter of choice. Korean unification is a matter of destiny for all Koreans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. And Skip and I have served together since 1998. Of course, Skip was only about 10 years old. Yeah. But we've served together at Korea many times over the years. And Skip has a very, uh, we've all got his hand out there, so you've got a pretty read ahead there. So he's going to talk about these very, um, I think, um, very practical and very unique uh, ideas. So Skip, over to you. Thank you, Dave. And I, Global Peace Foundation, I appreciate the invitation, um, Salib. It's nice to speak in front of you. Um, um, I don't speak very much in public. I, I'm not, you know, I feel like the junior member of the panel here. And, um, you know, but that's not a little nervous, but not because of that. But I, I'm nervous because I got three daughters watching this at home, and I'm going to hear about everything I say wrong at dinner tonight. So to start with, um, I did spend a lot of time on Korea. I finished SEAL training in, in the mid early 90s, and I went to SEAL Team 5, and immediately was enrolled in the uh, 
1994-95, uh, um, the kind of nuclear crisis, we almost went to war, and I deployed part four as part of that, and uh, I'm glad things were able to, 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 to uh, settle down. But after that, I spent uh, 12 years on Peninsula directly with four, four different assignments, working with Colonel Maxwell twice on that, and then other assignments off Peninsula work with other branches of the, go of the government on the career problem set. So it's something that I know a little bit about. I, I'm, I would say at least the security side, there are other experts in other areas, but I think in the security side, I have a perspective in that um, we don't have the expertise we used to have. In the 90s and, and even Iraq, we went to war other places. We spent 20 years fighting terrorists and we spent a lot of time looking at other problems and we kind of forgot about Korea. But the North Koreans haven't forgotten. They've survived incredible adversity as a government. I don't like it. But they've done what they've done. They survived done terrible things, and they developed nuclear weapons, and are soon going to have the you know demonstrate the capability of striking the United States with them. Not too distant future, I believe they'll test a live nuclear weapon at the end of at the end of a missile, and then the game will have changed because it's been in stasis since the end of the Cold War. When I first got there, we had experts who didn't really experts in governments who dealt with Korea and knew kind of how to handle it. Those are people who are, are retired now, and now the government people in government now in DOD and State Department and other branches of government. They've been focused on Ukraine for the last, in China for the last decade or so. And before that it was Middle East and not Korea. So the people have, there's a few experts in there, but not many. So we don't know what to do. It's better and easier to do nothing. And that's been our policy as, as I think you'd agree, sir, to do nothing and kind of like send some angry word letters, keep it in the box because it's always stayed in the box. North Korea has always ch chosen to stay in the box because they've had no options. In the day they got too far in line, we could have brought the hammer down and crushed them. Yeah, South Korea would have suffered. Yeah. But, you know, as, you know, I'm a little facetious there, but at the end of the day, South Korea would have suffered terribly, potentially, in a war, but they couldn't hurt the United States. Now they can. And so with the appointment about the, the glass thing is, is kind of chilling because I've been in that situation where similar conversations with real leaders with real power, and I'm like, ah, well, if they did that, we'd turn them to glass. I'm like, really? You, you think the president's going to authorize the strike if he thinks that we're going to lose trade five or six American cities for it? I mean, maybe, but you want to be in that situation. And so that's where I wanted here to talk today about today is, is that we're, we're kind of been really complacent because we don't know what to do. And now we're in a situation where very, very, in a very short period of time, Kim could force us. He could sell a nuclear weapon. Once he demonstrates that his, his missiles work with the live nuclear weapon on the end of it, what are we going to do if he sells a nuke? Or if he decides to shell Incheon Airport? But not enough to start a war, but enough to really poke South Korea really hard where South Korea has to respond. At the same time, he's like, hey, U.S., you get involved or you let Rocket involved. We're going to launch a lot of weapons at you. And they showed us 18 ICBMs in February, I believe it was. Can we stop 18 ICBMs with our missile defense system? Especially if they've shown they can do MIRVs and they're maneuverable and hypersonic and all these things they're working on. I don't know. But I don't want to be the one that makes that decision. So I think this is a really difficult time where Kim is entering a period of leverage that North Korea has never had. And therefore, it drives us to actually do something more aggressive than send angry word letters, which brings us to what can we do? I don't think military options are that great. I think we need to maintain a military thing, the options. But ultimately, if it comes down to trading blows, the eventually goes nuclear, we'll lose cities. South Korea and Japan might lose cities more, more likely. And certainly North Korea will cease to exist. But do we really want to go there? So what options do we have? I think we need to take the fight in the, inform in the information, you know, in the, in the information realm to North Korea. We need to talk to the North Korean people. Stop worrying about, about Kim. That he might get upset. Yeah, he will. But as somebody said about civilian, they got upset too. But we need to take the fight to them in the information out. So I put out a handout to you. It's I, I, something I wrote. I mean, Bob, Mr. Bob Collins helped me. He's a good friend and mentor. He helped me write it over a period of months. Kind of like it's just kind of a, a direct conversation with North Korean people. But it's meaningless coming from Skip Vincenzo, you know, retired nobody. It needs to come from the U.S. government and the Iraq government. We need to tell the North Korean people that he's the problem. We need to take the moral guy. We need to do what Reagan did, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, because they already know it. I'm not North Korean, but I believe North Korean people already know in their hearts that they really should be eating, that their kids shouldn't have starved in the streets, that they shouldn't have to ride on their neighbors, but they're not going to tell anybody because you do that, you're going to go away. And you know better than me the, the system that in place is that. That's implacable. We're not going to change that. But, and I'm not advocating that we need to get them to change that. What I'm saying is Kim is driving us with his, with his 
um, with, as George Hutchinson talked before about the abdicating the, of the reunification policy and the development of the weapons and things, he's driving to the point where I believe we're going to go to conflict with him because he thinks we're going to be too afraid to do something. And then we're going to either send more angry worded letters and give up extended deterrence and forsake our alliance and all these things which we can't afford to do, or we're going to take a stronger line than he's prepared to accept. And having gone so far, he will start a conflict. And we'll, it will either do, we'll either have to trade blows or we have another option. Our other option, we need to convince North Koreans at that point, they need to abandon him. And I believe it's possible. And there's historical precedents. East Germany came apart peacefully. The Cold War ended peacefully. Why? Because the people on the other side, not the leaders, well, kind of leaders anyway, but the people believed they had a better option. And they weren't able to do anything about it until they were forced to. When the, when the East Germany began to fall apart, Helmut Kohl made a 10-point promise to them about German, the rights under German unification. Basically guaranteed that they, you know, hey, take part in peaceful transition and you have a place. And they gave him concrete promises, which were credible. Information had seeped in for decades and they were credible. Information already seeps into North Korea, but we're too risk adverse to do anything to make it to focus that. So this is a lens. What I wrote was a lens that some of you have on the table. It'll be published as part of this thing. It's a lens for which North Koreans if we want them to act in like a in a matter that makes a difference that reduces violence, they have to know how to act. So tell them, tell them if your leader is foolish enough to start a war with nuclear weapons, you know, it, don't follow him. And to day to day, they of course they're going to follow him. But at that point, when if they truly believe that they're going to go to war and they're going to die, most any human being when they're looking at their children, their family, and their future, what else? How do I avoid this? And if a critical mass come to believe that he's the problem, that we really don't want to kill them, and that there's, if, you know, as they were talking about land transitional justice or land ownership and all these things, the promises we make are sincere, that they can have that life they already seen videos, they're already hearing about, that can actually be a, actually something that they can, that actually could happen, they might choose otherwise. If not, I can almost guarantee that North Koreans, like any other citizen world, will do what they're programmed to do, do what their country has told them to do, and they will fight. That will mean nuclear weapons will be used. On the other hand, let's say theoretically, with the Iraq, the U.S. and the Iraq governments get together and put out some version of this that's official, and they talk about it and publicize it, and really make firm commitments that convince North Korean people that we're sincere. Well, you're a North Korean missile commander, and you've kind of heard these things. You know what? You're not going to do anything. But now the order comes down to fire, and you know that you're going to. It's you know, it's going to come right back at you. But the other hand, you also heard that 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 you know, as part of this long-term campaign, that these missiles worth ten million dollars, not fired. How many missiles do you think are going to work? I mean, I'm just kind of it's just kind of spitballing how it would work. But human beings are human beings. If we tell them it's and they, they believe us sincerely, that's not our interest to fight. When the time comes, they're forced to choose. They're going to choose what's in their best interest. Most of them will. What better option do we have? And if you're thinking, well, that would never work, you know, why would they do, you know, why would they do that? You're probably not asking the que right question. What other choice do they have? So I, I'll i wrap up because I'm not, um, again, I'm not a, a robust speaker on this, but I, I do think it's worth considering that it's time to take an aggressive stand against North Korea in the information, in the information space. We can't be afraid of Kim's reaction. If we wait, a year, two, three years, we'll be in a, as somebody has already pointed out multiple times, we'll, we'll be in a much worse situation. Thank you. I'd ask uh, just one one thing from you, Dr. Lee. One, I have one request. Please use some Shakespeare in your remarks. He's the only person I know who can talk about national security and Shakespeare. So I throw that out as a challenge to you, as you always uh, you always impress me with that. Thank you uh, to the Global Peace Foundation and Colonel Maxwell for this opportunity. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking the time out of your busy day to be here. It was in late January 2023 on a visit to South Korea. We were standing at Panmunjom on the South Korean side peering into North Korea, one of our delegation members asked me, what's going through your mind? It was Sir John Scarlett, the former chief of MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service. He said, I've been all over the world, but this is positively the strangest place I've ever been. 
probably the strangest place on earth. And I thought about it and I replied, what's going through my mind is profound sadness. Profound sadness. Just by chance, I was born in Seoul. Korea, South Korea was very poor when I was a boy, but I've not, never had a life of extreme privation and extreme oppression, had a good education. I've been very fortunate. Whereas in North Korea, it's all hereditary. Not only power at the very top, not only the three generations of Kims who have abused their people over the past almost eight decades now, but everything else, misery, oppression, terror, and hunger, extreme hunger. This year marks the 30th anniversary of a singular event in world history. That is the onset of the North Korean famine. Why is it a unique event in history? Well, Nick Eberstadt taught me this during his presentation at Harvard University in March 2001. And I've been testing his hypothesis, and he is, of course, right, which is the North Korean famine is the world's first and only instance, only case of an industrialized, urbanized, literate, peacetime economy to suffer a famine. Again, North Korea is the only country in world history that had gained the tremendous economic advantages of industrialization, urbanization, and 100%, virtually 100% adult literacy, and was not embroiled in an active war or insurrection, yet managed to suffer a devastating nationwide famine that may have killed some 10% of the North Korean population. Most likely, we will never see this artificial, very unnatural disaster again anywhere else in the world. We know that famine and famine-like situations have been with us all throughout history, and even today, famines and famine-like situations we observe in immiserated, agriculture-based, and largely societies where adult illiteracy, conventionally defined as the inability to write your own name for anyone over the age of 16, is rampant again. The world, many countries suffer famine-like situations today, but these are all agriculture-based, pre-industrial economies, very poor countries where adult illiteracy is quite high, in some countries as high as 90% for the adult population. Every year, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization publishes a multi-hundred page report called The State of Food Security and Undernourishment in the World. And one metric that the report uses to try to assess the severity of hunger in countries all over the world is, quote, the prevalence of undernourishment in the total population, end quote, meaning what percent of the population is estimated to be in a chronic state of hunger? For 2023, the worst food insecure nation is Madagascar, with approximately 51% of the population who are in a chronic state of hunger. Tied for the number two spot are Somalia with 40, 42% and the Central African Republic with 43% of the population. And then it's the DPRK, the Despotic People's Republic of Korea, with 46% of the population. By the way, there is no such an official list. It would be discourteous and undiplomatic, but it's not hard to put one together, and I have, down to the top 20 hungriest nations on earth. Nowhere in the top 20 list is there a 100% literate society. Nowhere on that list 
is a country in possession of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic weapons, ballistic missiles. And many countries suffer from severe adult illiteracy. 60% in Chad, 62% in Afghanistan. Again, North Korea achieved literacy before South Korea did. North Korea was ahead of South Korea in industrial output, at least until the early 1970s. And 30 years ago, North Korea took a great leap backward by undergoing the famine. And every year, without fail, since the onset of the famine in 1994, North Korea has been and remains among the hungriest nations on earth. Why do I dwell on this unique and shocking phenomenon so much? Well, when we hear about crimes against humanity, for those of us living in thriving open democracies, very few of us have first-hand or even second-hand experience of state crimes like illegal surveillance, arbitrary and unlawful arrest and torture, being thrown into a political prisoner concentration camp, disappearance of person. These serious crimes, crimes against humanity, come across as an abstraction. It's very hard to empathize with these extreme crimes in which we don't have firsthand experience. But all of us, all of us can relate to hunger. At one point, we've all been hungry. And I don't mean, of course, a chronic state of hunger, but by chance or circumstance, having a very busy day, we've skipped a meal or two in the past, we can relate to it. This story needs to be told to the North Korean people that you, the vast majority of the North Korean people, are hungry and have been hungry for the past three decades, not because your leadership is poor, not because Kim Jong-un does not have the money with which to import food and distribute it equitably, not because of climate change or US sanctions or UN sanctions, but because of the perverse deliberate policy of mass starvation. The UN Commission of Inquiry report of 2014 makes that very serious allegation that the North Korean regime at the highest level is guilty of, quote, a policy of deliberate mass starvation. That phrase appears more than a dozen times in the section on how North Korea uses food as a weapon against its own people, uh, pages 144 to 208. <clears throat> Elsewhere, the report alleges that the Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un regime is guilty of, quote, knowingly causing prolonged starvation, end quote. It's tempting to believe in silly and simple theories. Oh, yes, U.S. sanctions, they've been in effect forever. <clears throat> but of course, during the Cold War, basically, it was no trade policy. It was clunky not very effective. And as for UN sanctions, we did not see UN sanctions until 2006 in the wake of North Korea's first nuclear test. That is more than a decade after the onset of the famine. And US sanctions become biting only as of 2016, when the first ever North Korea specific sanctions legislation was passed and signed into law during the Obama administration. And as for climate change, it might be an exacerbating factor. But if we were really to believe that the North Korean people are hungry because of climate change, well, let me ask you, by what marvel of nature does climate change every year without fail, right at the border, North Korea's border with China and its southern border with South Korea, where hardly anyone goes to bed hungry? South Korea should take the leadership in telling this story, this fact, to the people of North Korea. You are hungry because of the perverse policies and priorities of your government. 
Moreover, South Korea and the United States do, would do well to tell the North Korean people that over the past almost 80 years, the conditions of life in North Korea have been demonstrably worse than life under colonial Japan. During the US occupation of Japan, 1945 to 1952, had the US followed Japanese examples in colonial Korea, the US may have done any of the following. I'm making, I'm trying to make the point that Japanese colonial rule in Korea, 1910 to 1945, was extremely cruel. The US might have, in occupying Japan, may have forced the Japanese to take on American sounding last names like Smith or Jackson, may have started the school day elementary schools with the singing of the American national anthem, the teachers wearing a sword or a rifle to intimidate the students, may have imposed on the Japanese people Protestant Christianity as their only religion, uh, would have, may have, the Americans would, may have uh, dominated every industry, every sector, government, with no plan of ever restoring sovereignty to the people of Japan, may have forcibly repatriated hundreds of thousands of young Japanese men to work in harsh conditions throughout the United States, may have forcibly repatriated young girls and young women to serve in military brothels in the persecution or prosecution of American wars elsewhere. We know the United States did none of this. In fact, quite the opposite, gave generously to Japan some two billion US dollars worth, which was the equivalent of the annual budget at the time. Yet, had the Kim dynasty did what Japan had in colonial Korea, the Kim dynasty may have allowed for any of the following. Let the people choose where to live. Let the people choose where to send their children to school. Let the people allow the people the freedom of internal movement and travel abroad. Allow the people to accrue wealth, private property and assets. Allow the people to worship, go to church or a monastery. Allow the people to barter, to sell and purchase food allow the people the right to live, allow the people for, to have mixed marriage between two different ethnic people instead of forcibly aborting fetuses, forcibly aborting fetuses uh, if a North Korean woman is impregnated in China and forcibly repatriated back to North Korea. So the conditions of life in North Korea over the past nearly eight decades have been markedly worse than life under colonial Japan. I don't mean to defend Japanese policies, but I'm trying to make the point that this is a demonstrable fact that the Kim dynasty has been markedly worse than colonial Japan. This story must be told to the people of North Korea and to the people of South Korea. We all know that South Korean society as a collectivity largely remains apathetic to human rights situations in North Korea. And that's because they don't teach you anything about North Korea or North Korean human rights in middle school or high school. If South Korea put North Korea human rights as a subject on the national college entrance exam, everyone will become North Korea experts, but they don't do that. So to echo what has been said before, our unrelenting failure of nuclear diplomacy and turning a blind eye to human rights in North Korea over the past three decades, um, I think we should learn from history. I'll end with a quote from Samuel Taylor Coleridge instead of Shakespeare. <clears throat> if men could learn from history, what lessons it might teach us. But party and passion blind our eyes. 
and the light which experience gives us is but a lantern on the stern that shines only on the waves behind us. We should learn from history. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And then that was a great, a great quote to, uh, to end with, so I thank you for that. Um, at this time, we've got a few more minutes. I want to give each of the panelists a chance to respond. I, I know you'll all agree with me that we've heard very substantive uh, um, remarks from everyone. And so I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, each of them to, if there's anything that they heard that they want to reflect on, um, and, uh, and then we'll try to get to some Q&A. Ambassador Dillon? Thank you, Dave. Let me thank the other panelists. I've learned a great deal just listening to them for the, the past few minutes. Uh, let me just make three, three comments very briefly. When I and others have gone to brief on the outcome of our study providing this alternative strategic framework, we've gotten criticism on both the left and the right. The left Criticism is, it's the usual, it's the name calling, you know, Joseph's just nothing, just a neocon, wants to use force to overthrow another government like, like Iraq. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been called a lot of things. The neocon thing doesn't bother me. I mean, my own grandchildren call me boom, boom. So, you know, where do you go from there? <laughs> On the right, though, it's a more interesting criticism. On the right, it's, well, in your paper, you say that there's going to be this huge increase, and it's a, it's a RAND projection, not mine, in the stockpile of North Korea and the threat of the nuclear threat from North Korea. And you say human rights, pushing human rights is going to stop this? They say, come on, Bob, that's, you know, that's, that's something that the left talks about. And my response is that, well, it may not sort of result in the end of the regime by 2027, but we've got to start somewhere. We've got to have this greater comprehensive, it's not just human rights, it's, it's all these other pieces. And we need, to, we need to prepare, to prepare for collapse. I, the previous panel talked about that about the economic dimension, but there's a political dimension, there's a military dimension, there's a diplomatic dimension. And we, we, it's a lot of work and we need, we, need to start, we need to start doing that. But putting human rights up front, I've, I'm, I'm just thoroughly convinced that that, that, is, the, that is the key. Uh, and that was my second point. My, thir my third point uh, deals with a couple of the questions that have been raised by the panel. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, North Korea's nuclear program, where North Korea doesn't have to test a missile with an RV, okay, with a re-entry vehicle before, I mean, that's, that's sort of the agencies saying, yeah, well, they, they you know, we, we, we can't certify that they have the capability until, you know, until they test with an RV. That's just not, that's just not true, okay? It's just, it's just not accurate. And if North Korea can advance their missile program to include hypersonics, to include all of the most sort of sophisticated capabilities that, that they have demonstrated, they can certainly put together an RV that can stand re-entry, okay? And then in terms of our missile defense, and I think this is a lesson for all of us with regard to North Korea, we deployed a capability, a rudimentary capability in 2004. Again, this was President Bush. 2004. 20 years later, we still have a rudimentary capability. Is it because we haven't funded it? No. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on it. It's because of bad ideas, because of bad policy, because administrations after administrations, Republican and Democrat alike, have said, well, we can't militarize space. Now think about that for a moment. Think about what the Russians are doing in space. Think about what the Chinese are doing in space, what the Iranians, what the North Koreans in terms of militarization. Space is militarized. Our own Joint Chief says, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it's a uh, contentious environment. It's, it's an, we have a space force, but it's only missile defense. It's only the defense of our country. And this is, this is the legacy of sort of the ABM thinking. 
One thing I've learned in my 26 years in government is that bad ideas never go away in Washington. They just don't go away. And you've got to, you know, I've, I've spent most of my career fighting bad ideas. And, you know, it's like, it's like our North Korea policy. Okay, well, we'll send our envoy out to say, well, we're ready to negotiate anywhere, anytime, anyplace. Okay, but the, the threat continues to grow and we have to have a fundamental shift in how we think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Greg? Um, there are several distinctive features of the North Korean conundrum, the perennial humanitarian crisis, the abysmal human rights violations, the severe human security situation, North Korea's ever-growing nuclear arsenal, Ambassador Joseph, mentioned the RAND Corporation report 200 nuclear weapons by 2025 next year. North Korea's ever-developing and ever-growing uh, ballistic missile program. There is uh, certainly one and only one solution to this North Korean conundrum, and that is unification under a free, prosperous, democratic Republic of Korea. Earlier, I mentioned that both ethnic and civic nationalism will be extraordinarily important. Civic nationalism, a good understanding of civic nationalism will ensure the success of unification. Democratic values are at the very core of this civic nationalism that will enable a successful unification. Human rights is at the very core uh, of that set of values. This is a, a, an issue of critical importance to both South and North Koreans. It is truly about the eventual success of unification and the prosperity and why not the survival of the nation. So it's, it's not simply an abstraction. Uh, this is an issue that's of critical importance to the security of the people of a unified Korea. Of course, the Republic of Korea, the Republic of Korea has evolved extraordinarily. There was a generation that safeguarded the Republic, sacrificed during the Korean War. There was a generation that forged the Han River miracle. There was a generation that democratized the Republic of Korea. There will be a generation that unifies the Republic of Korea. And a unified Korea, of course, will continue evolving. But that is truly the only conceivable scenario. Thank you. And Skip, uh, if you would include in your remarks, uh, just uh, the way that you crafted your uh, 10 points there, um, I, I don't think it was clear that you are really talking to the Korean people countering the 10 points of monolithic ideology. Would, yes. you, would you just add, add to that? Because I think that's very important for all of us to understand why, why you framed it that way and how you're using their own framework to communicate with them. Well, I, Kim Jong-un's, Kim Il-sung's own framework. I hesitate to speak about the 10 points of monolithic ideology in front of um, you, sir, because obviously you lived it. But, you know, as Bob Collins would point out, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty much a guidebook of how they live, and it, it's control mechanism for, for how, how, to, how the propaganda, you know, the internal propagandization, or whatever the word is, it, it, it's based on that. And the weekly self-criticisms are how you violate that. And those are the crimes that the regime uses. That's how they maintain their control. Like how, when you see people on TV, I believe, and they're, they're, they're afraid to say anything because they're thinking in the back of the mind, so what's these 10 principles am I going to violate? You know, and, and so I, Bob and I were talking about this. Well, how do we convince North Koreans that we're, we're sincere, that we offer a different thing? We'll put it in the same framework. But then you tell them what it is that we guarantee them. And, and I think that's where we came from. But what I want to add to this is how do we do that let's say that this in rocket speed of government the next time the u.s and, uh, and korean presidents get together they 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 like it and they say they actually produces a joint statement and this gets official so now it's not just skip vincenzo it's an actual official alliance document that we believe this and we've take the aggressive step and kim doesn't like it but how do we actually convince the north koreans sincere it's not about the movies it's about showing them that we're better and right now and it's a positive example Sometimes I, sorry, sir, I hate the State Department in much like the, D, the DOD has the same bureaucracy. Um, but like I've talked to actual State Department officials, senior people about how do you get North Koreans to, to, to pay attention? They're like, well, you we know, right now the 2004 Human Rights Act authorizes North Koreans to request asylum. We're not publicizing it. We're not pushing it to North Koreans. They can do that. And we're not helping them do that. 
They're good. They get to Thailand. If you've seen Beyond Utopia, they get to Thailand. They, if they're lucky, they sit in the detention for a few weeks and then they go to, or months and they go to South Korea in, in a relatively short period of time. Few come to the United States. There's about 300 plus or minus. I there's about, I don't know, 30 to 50 in DC area, Virginia, and I know a lot of them. And, and in one of them, the, the, in this area, she has a hair salon in Falls Church, believe it or not. My wife, we first met her wife, like, what? She thought, my wife thought she was talking to a lady from South Korea and said, no, I'm from North Korea. And she is, and her son's stuck in China. She's been trying for a decade now that she's American to get her son out of China. State Department's not helpful. She submitted twice, like, oh, you forgot paperwork. No, you didn't. She submitted to a lawyer. They just, bureaucracy, bureaucratic doesn't care. So if you want to convince North Koreans that we care, fix the problem. We're not going to get a flood of North Koreans. There's not millions that are going to show up. But you get a, you know, if you tell them, if the State Department were to make an effort to, to put a counselor officer whose job it is to facilitate these people when they show up in, the, in, the, in, the, in Thailand, to facilitate them you know, coming to the United States, they have a positive experience here. Those same people do still communicate with friends, friends and family back home. What better possible con, you know, convincing evidence they have that you come to the United States, your life gets better. Or you come to Europe, your life gets better, because that's generally what happens. But the State Department, and I'm not just picking on the State Department, DOD is exactly the same. It's like, oh, we don't, they don't have the expertise to understand why they shouldn't pay. Like, oh, we'd rather them go to South Korea. Gonna be, yeah, but if we get in a war, we'd like them to know that, we're, they, that they can trust these 10 points. And so what I'm saying is, it's the kind of things that we could do to help North Koreans now, even those outside of North Korea, to have a better life. Help this help the hairdresser. She's an actual human being. I won't give her a name, but she's an actual human being whose son is in China and she can't get him out because the State Department, they're just not helpful. And it's all you can do the process. How does one person who's struggling to get her job and business and work, how do they have time like any of the rest of us fighting the same bureaucracy of, over whether it's your driver's license or whatever other issue you have? If you really want to make a difference, help North Koreans now who are outside North Korea enjoy and have a better life here and then help them communicate it back into North Korea. Provide a little funding. Don't worry about the risks. They already call their family, but it's super expensive. Pay a little more to help them, uh, the view they're in the United States, communicate with their family back home. The ones that are in Europe, communicate with their family home. And just to, so they do it more than once every couple of years. Think about that. If you talk every month, you'd be talking about, hey, I got a dog, I got a car. I got, you know, I go to the dentist. And if you're North Korean, I, I imagine sort of that you're like, really? You have a dog and you have a dentist? You own your own business? I mean, you can't do that in a 30 second conversation or once, a, once every five year conversation. So let's help these people communicate more. Let's help them, in, you know, fit in better and then help them communicate more. That's how we make a 10 point promise realistic because then North Koreans believe that we're sincere and that we actually are better than the, what they hear. So I'll close my remarks because I get emotional about it. Thank you, Skip. And Sung Yoon, any uh, final remarks? Hmm. I heard Ambassador Joseph say at the Committee for at the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea back in late November last year that the United States never had a serious denuclearization policy, but resorted only to spurts of arms control talks over the years. Um, I couldn't agree more. One reason I think for our failure over the past decades is attitudinal, that is our tendency to underestimate and patronize North Korea. In the wake of the invasion, the start of the Korean War, a senior official in the US State Department coming out of a National Security Council meeting told reporters, quote, the relationship between Stalin and Kim Il-sung is exactly the same as that between Walt Disney and Donald Duck. That is, Kim Il-sung is not his own man. Stalin created Kim Il-sung and Kim Il-sung is merely following Stalin's orders to invade the South. I think the record shows, not only with respect to the origins of the Korean War, but history over the past eight decades, that North Korea has agency, North Korea has a strategy. They are such a weird mix of medieval mores and buffoonish bellicosity, it's hard not to mock them, not to deride and make fun of them, but they are to be taken very seriously. Um, one thing that North Korea is trying to achieve at this very moment, in my humble estimation, is once again to tell the world, and in particular South Korea, the following. North Korea's right to shoot at South Korea 
is the moral equivalence of South Korea sending information into North Korea. What happened in 2015 was North Korea and South Korea, after North Korea shot some bullets into the South, met and negotiated, and South Korea decided to turn off the loudspeakers blaring into North Korea, K-pop and the news and so on. And at the time, this was viewed as North Korea being terrified of South Korean propaganda and pop culture and so on. That may be, but you see what North Korea achieved was to drive home the point that our right to shoot at you is the same as your right, the universal human right to share information regardless of medium and borders. North Korea is trying to do that with those feces covered balloons, trash ridden balloons, and is setting the stage to try to incite South Koreans to blame President Yoon of South Korea for not blocking the activists who send balloons into North Korea, and then with the next escalation to incite South Koreans to once again lay the blame on the South Korean government for escalating when in fact the Vice Minister of Defense of North Korea in a statement on June 2nd said, oh, for now we are temporarily suspending balloon launches into the South, thus coming across as the more restrained party. I mentioned this to make the very simple point that they are very clever, they have a plan. And even, you know, a post-provocation post peace ploy, these fake charm offensives, by the time Kim Jong-un resorted to a dramatic image makeover by coming out in 2018, it was like Rambo 4. We've seen this movie many times before, going back to the grandfather in 1972, in the wake of Richard Nixon's visit to, the, to, to China, you know, the client states of the United States and China freaked out. North Korea, North Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, are they abandoning us? What did Kim Il-sung do? Retreat into a cocoon and be angry? No, he came out. He met with two New York Times reporters in his office for three hours on May 26, 1972. The reporters came away with the view, not only is he not crazy, but he's actually very smart, knows a lot, kind of a visionary leader, they said. And then the next month met, met with Kim Il-sung met with a Washington Post reporter. And then the next month in July with a Harvard Law professor and many, many Japanese reporters throughout the year, thus coming across as a reasonable chap with whom we can do business. We saw this with Kim Jong-il for the first six years upon inheriting power. Kim Jong-il acted crazy, lobbed missile over Japan on August 31st, Sunday, 1998. Started deadly skirmishes with South Korea. Then six years later, he showed up in Beijing in late May. Why? Because he had an important first ever summit meeting with the South Korean president in Pyongyang the next month. And then he greeted, uh, he received a man called Vladimir Putin in Pyongyang in mid-July 2000, the first ever visit by a top Russian or Soviet leader to North Korea. It's all predictable. They follow a script, a very careful script. And then, of course, Kim Jong-un sent a special envoy to, envoy to President Clinton, and uh, Clinton sent his Secretary of State 12 days later to North Korea and so on. And that visit, Clinton's visit, didn't materialize because of the November 7th presidential election and the Florida vote recount, um, which was not resolved until Al Gore finally conceded defeat in mid-December that year. So my, sorry to be long-winded, what I'm trying to say is we should not underestimate North Korea. And, and I know military experts don't, assessing North Korea's military capabilities, but um, the diplomats, officials, we tend to underestimate North Korea and think, well, if we are a bit nicer, courteous, generous, give them more money and food, maybe they'll come around. I think history clearly shows that's not the case. They have a plan, whereas we don't. Thank you. All right. <laughs> So we're coming up on uh, on our closing time here. So I'm going to make a few closing remarks. And I, I'd like to start with what uh, Dr. Lee just said about not underestimating uh, the North. I think that that's very important. We need to really understand uh, the nature of the Kim family regime. Uh, and it is socialist, uh, Bill. Uh, you know, it's not just, through, I, I get the socialist. Uh, but we need to understand the nature of the regime, its objective, and its strategies. 
And I think that, um, you know, to your point, Dr. Lee, what I see as a practitioner and not as an academic expert, but I see a lot of people trying to apply conventional international relations theory to North Korea. Uh, and and I, think, I think a lot of people apply nuclear theory as well. And that's why we get the ABM treaty and, and that kind of stuff. And, and that works in theory, but does it work in the real world? And, and that's, what I, that's what I think our problem is. We are not dealing with, uh, and, and we gave this words to Dr. Perry in 1999, in the Perry Policy Re uh, Review. We have to deal with North Korea as it really is and not as we wish it would be. And I think that's really one of our, our problems uh, is that we, we deal with it as we wish it could be or we mirror image or we try to force North Korea into conventional uh, international relations theory. Now, I just want to offer a couple of practical things. So we've talked about information, and I just want to get on the record a couple of things to kind of bring together a, a lot of the important uh, comments here. You know, we should have an information campaign, South Korean-led, U.S.-supported, alliance, uh, and, but we all can contribute to information. Um, but a couple of things at the, at the national level is that whenever North Korea launches or launches a missile or tests a nuclear weapon, we should always include that they are doing that at the expense of their people, that it is a deliberate priority decision made by the regime to prioritize the development of nuclear weapons and missiles over the welfare of their people. And so that should be a, a, a statement that South Korea and the United States makes always. In 2022, they fired some 67 missiles and they estimate that cost about $615 million. $615 million. And the World Food Program estimated that North Korea had a shortfall of $410 million. You know, I don't do public math, but there's a, there's a discrepancy there. You know, and so we need to, and that's one of the human rights aspects that we should be emphasizing in conjunction with, with nuclear weapons. I mean, you can't separate them. I think we've all made that point. Uh, so we need to have a deliberate, and, and here's the word that, that uh, George used during his, the narrative. What is our narrative? Now, we're talking about it here. It, it's human rights. It's information. It's free and unified Korea. But we've got to create the new narrative. And Skip's work helps, helps uh, uh, contribute to that with the 10 points there. You know, we're talking about creating a new narrative for the Korean people in the North. I use that phrasing very deliberately. Uh, Korean people in the North, Korean people in the South, not North and South Koreans. Why? Because it is a unified one Korea. They're all Korean people. Um, but we need to create a narrative uh, and, and, and tell that story, tell the three stories that Greg has to the Korean people in the North. So a couple things to do. Three target audiences, the regime elite, the uh, second tier leadership, the military leadership, and the population. They, we all need to target messages uh, towards them, and they need to be tailored for those. You know, but there are simple concepts that we need to do for the military leaders. If you don't attack the South, you'll have a place in the unified Korea. You know, we want to prevent war, you know, so, you know, do not attack the South and you'll have a place in the unified Korea. But we have four principles of information. We need to have massive quantities of information. The defectors, the escapees, they're sending a lot in, but so much more could be done. I asked uh, Dr. Schulte this week, you know, I said, wouldn't you like to send information all across the DMZ and not just from Kongwa Island? And she, yeah, of course, you know, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we sending information across the entire DMZ? You know, why doesn't Korea Telecom establish uh, cell phone towers on the South Barrier Fence with the, the highest power capable to broadcast cell, cell uh, uh uh, connectivity into the north in the southern regions and then have North Korean soldiers drop Samsung handsets on the MDL on every patrol pre-programmed with phone numbers to the South Korean commanders uh, and of course with all the apps and everything that a smartphone could have and give the frontline forces access to uh, to communications um, you know I would I would I would, uh, I would put dating apps on on them 
I, I would. You know, we want people to people contact. You know, you and we can't. We can't go to North Korea. But you know, if you put a, uh, if you give them a phone and you can talk to someone in the South, think about the relationships that you know when people talking about what their lives are like. You know, and and I, I think you could really make a difference. But uh, so we need massive quantities of information. Not enough is going in. We need to have, and that's news to entertainment. Entertainment is really important. Uh, we we hear about uh, the um, uh, the K dramas that are really uh, that people desire and want. Uh, but one of the the most important things I heard from a former North Korean soldier about the uh, K drama crash landing on you uh, was, you know, I asked him. I, I was talking to seven former soldiers, and I said, "What does that that K drama do?" for the military in North Korea. And they said, it makes them want to come to South Korea even more. But one of them said that that drama had such an impact. Why? Because it did not portray the Korean soldiers or the Korean people in the North as monsters, as the enemy. You know, and they were they said that that must mean that South Korea is strong and confident, that they didn't have to propagandize and, and just make out the North Korean soldiers to be bad. And he said, because that doesn't happen in North Korea. And so that kind of subtle message in a comedy drama, uh, you know, K-drama that, uh, uh, you know, it had an impact uh, and, and really uh, influenced them. So massive quantities of information, practical information from markets, how do markets work, how to maximize, uh, you know, and, and how to, to develop them. So practical information from market activity to organizing for collective action. I ask, I ask uh, Kenji, uh, Miss uh, Kawasaki, when uh, from Japan, and she of course went to North Korea and, and came back. But I ask a lot of a lot of uh, people from North Korea, why don't you stand up and fight back against this regime? You know, we in America, we wouldn't tolerate this kind of tyranny. But what I'm told is they don't know what to do because of the indoctrination, the the severe control. They don't know what to do. So we need to send Gene Sharps from dictatorship to democracy, which is translated into Korean. Uh, we need to send that into the North. You know, 250 nonviolent uh, resistance techniques. You know, we we should send that into the into the North. Um, so practical information on collective action, and then truth, facts. As Hyun Hyun Sung Lee told me, Korean people in the North want facts, and uh, and that's how they they determine the truth. And so we need to send that into the North. And of course, lastly, is understanding their human rights, what they are entitled to as human beings. But a major theme must be that Kim Jong-un's strategies have failed. You know, his, they have failed. And what he is doing is because of failure. Uh, and that needs to be, that, that needs to be uh, transmitted to the, to the Korean people in the North. The bottom line in all of this is that, uh, you know, the only way we're going to see an end to the nuclear threat and the human rights abuses is through unification. You know, it, in, a, in a vision, a narrative, you know, has to be for the Korean people to unify themselves. They determine their own government. But the ideal, I think, would be a secure, stable, non-nuclear a uh, unified Korea that is unified under a liberal constitutional form of government, you know, based on freedom, individual liberty, uh, the rule of law, free market economy, and human rights for all. Uh, and that's really how we bring about change. We must support the Koreans. The Koreans have to solve the Korea question, but I think we all as human beings, uh, fellow citizens of the world, have a responsibility to help Koreans to help themselves. So with that, I will say we know one dream and one Korea. We know Tong Il, you know, which is unification. And I think unification is you rock, you are okay. And, uh, and I'll close with, from my background as a Green Beret Special Forces, we say de oppresso liber, which means to free the oppressed. But really it means to help the oppressed free themselves. And that's what we must do. So thank you for everyone. I want to I want to say thank you to our conveners. Uh, thank you to Congressman Whitman's office and Congressman for uh, his remarks. And uh, thank you to the GPF staff who put all this together. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the hard work everybody did. Thank you.